started. Uh, we're going to get an emerging technology keynote to get us going. And then uh, we have uh, hopefully uh, Ann Duncan from, she's here, from the Energy Department after that. So uh, we'll get started right now. And let's get uh, Spencer Crankshaw from Pluralsight up here to do a little emerging technology keynote. So, Spencer, I have your microphone. You want to take it away? I'm allowed to touch it. You, this this one you can. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for for letting me do this. I I don't know who allowed me to have a microphone, but honored to introduce somebody that probably does not need an introduction. And I was told to not do this in a boring monotone way, so I did a very not cliche thing and put a bio into a large language model and said, "Make this interesting." So I'm going to read that to you, and uh, you can let me know how that did. So the pressure's off of me, if that's all right. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage. Oh, we're good. Am I, am I okay to continue? Slow it down, ladies and gentlemen, and pause for a dramatic effect. All right, we'll 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 continue slowly here. Maybe there's a prompt to make this a little longer if we need a stall, but uh, please welcome to the stage, the powerhouse of innovation and leadership, Ann Duncan. Currently serving as the chief information officer at the US Department of Energy, Ann's impact reverberates across the nation's technological landscape with a diverse background spanning the public and private sectors. She's not just leading the charge on modernization and cybersecurity, but also fostering collaboration and driving digital transformation. In her previous roles, including CIO at the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency and Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Dell Technologies, Anne has consistently pushed the boundaries of what's possible in technology. Her journey from engineering and research at Hewlett Packard to pioneering IT strategies for governmental agencies is nothing short of inspiring. A published, a published author, and sought after speaker, Anne's expertise in government technology modernization and digital transformation is unparalleled. Her accolades, including the prestigious Capital CIO Large Enterprise Orbi Award and numerous recognitions from industry giants like Computer World and State Scoop, speak volumes about her impact and influence. All right, I'm running out of material, so how much time do we still need here? You've got, okay, good, good. Beyond her professional achievements, Anne holds a Master's of Science and a Bachelor of Industrial Engineering degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology, where she was later honored with induction into the Academy of Distinguished Engineering Alumni. As a licensed and professional engineer in multiple states, Anne's commitment to excellence and innovation knows no bounds. Please join me in welcoming at some point, the trailblazer, the innovator, and visionary leader, Anne Duncan. So, so, so Anne will just be another second. And there she is now. I see her. We see she's there. She is. Woo! She's gonna hate me now. All right. While she makes, while she takes a breath and, and makes her way up here, I, I do have trivia because that's you know what I do. Plus, it's after lunch. I want everyone to get a little energy going. And I did this trivia question directly for you. Um, I um, I um, have to admit something. I read your budget. So you can't answer the question. This is you're you're not allowed. All right. And with, if Steve Brand's here, he can't answer it either. You can't he can't answer it either. Steve, if you're still here, you can't answer it. You can't answer this question. Okay. All right. So I did a little research. How much money is the DOE requesting for 2025 for critical cybersecurity investments, including those related to zero trust, post-quantum cryptography pilot programs, developing guidelines and best practices for managing AI in critical infrastructure and cybersecurity? So how much money? We're looking for a dollar amount. Don't answer it. Steve, don't answer it. Steve doesn't, seems like a oh. No one has an idea. Two billion. Oh. That's wrong. <laughs> Another guess. 90 million, very close. One more guess. 200 million, too high. Uh, $100 million. That's what the budget said. Up from 93 million in 2025. Now in all, when you look at the entire budget that Ann is requesting specifically, 
$229 million for 2025, which is $14 million or about a 7% increase over 2023 because of the way the budget works. So there's some money. There's some money. All right. And that's all I got. How big is DOE? Yeah, exactly. All right. So, so my second trivia question. So first of all, they said I had seven minutes. So I went to the restroom. So yeah, yeah. Um, so um, let's see, where are my notes? My notes here. Um, so my trivia question is self-serving, completely self-serving because I'm very proud and happy. Um, and Steve, you can't answer it. Stephen, you can't answer this one either because you know, I know you know this answer. Uh, when was my first granddaughter born? Come on. Close. You're close. Um, a little less than that. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. She's uh, eight pounds, two ounces. So I'm very excited, as you can tell. So I had to throw that one in there. So um, so, it's, so I'm going to, um, I apologize. I'm going to have to use my notes today because there's so much really good stuff going on at DOE um, that I can't, I can't do it all uh, by, uh, you know, just coming up here and talking. So I'm going to be parking my silver podium with my notes. It's a real thrill to be here. Um, and uh, I always, you know, I live in DC. I almost never get to drive my car. So just getting to get out and drive my car <laughs> this morning was nice. Um, so um, it's, you know, everyone seems to want to talk about AI. And of course, we're going to talk about AI today um, and what the federal government's doing in AI. Uh, DOE has uh, the critical and immense mission of ensuring America's security and prosperity by addressing energy, environment, and uh, nuclear challenges through transformative science and technology solutions. Um, or as I say, you know, if you think you know what DOE does, you're probably wrong. Um, so as a COE uh, CIO, gosh, it's going to be a long day. Um, as the CIO for DOE, uh, my responsibilities span IT service delivery, cybersecurity, technology innovation, digital transformation, and enabling collaboration. Uh, they also include preparing the agency for the opportunities and risks of emerging technologies. Uh, we all agree, I think, that AI, like virtually every new technology, has the potential to enable tremendous progress on the critical challenges of our time. Uh, from the climate crisis and healthcare to scientific progress and equitable economic growth. But at the same time, AI poses considerable risks uh, in various kinds, including risks related to national security, cybersecurity information, cybersecurity, information security, privacy, and much more. So um, we they even have the ability to change our understanding of reality itself for better or worse. Uh, the potential of AI is vast, and we must work towards minimizing the risks and um, maximizing the benefits. And so, you know, we really don't have a choice. We have to work with AI because our adversaries will. So if we skip it, they're just going to get that much further ahead of us. So today I'm going to talk, uh, spend a little bit of time on DOE's work in the realm of AI. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the assets uh, that make DOE a uh, valuable contributor in this field and share some examples of our work. I'll talk a bit about the work we're doing to implement the administrative's executive order on AI, um, including addressing the risks it offers. And I'll also talk about creating an AI-enabled workforce. Um, so I'm gonna dive into that. Um, so as you probably know, the historic roots of DOE reach back to the days of the Manhattan Project and the race to win World War II. Uh, the department itself was formed in 1977 uh, coalescing around that legacy mission with many energy programs from across the federal government. Key to driving the success of DOE's mission is DOE's network of 17 national labs. These labs have created many scientific breakthroughs, including advances in computing sciences, and that's really specifically the area in which I'll talk today. So our labs have created almost 50% of the world's fastest publicly benchmarked supercomputers, DOE designed, developed, and operates uh, four of the 10 fastest supercomputers in the world. Uh, the Frontier supercomputer developed by Oak Ridge National Lab is the world's fastest and first exascale computer. And it, uh, it's performing, you see why I'm in a second, why I need my notes, two quintillion 
calculations per second. And it also is the second most energy efficient computer in the world at 62.86 gigaflops per watt. Please don't ask me to give you a, 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 an idea of what that is. It's, it's, it's efficient. Um, so in addition, we have the science to develop models and leverage computational AI capabilities to meet DOE and national mission priorities. So for example, the North American Energy Resiliency Model is a collaboration between DOE headquarters and eight national laboratories to develop and deploy modeling for resilience analysis. So the NARM model predicts wildfire impacts on Western grid infrastructure, um, and it uses climate data along with weather data and the results are used to um, maximize the resilience benefits of that infrastructure. For example, to decide um, at what, what locations uh, to move a power line underground or to harden a, a transformer so that we can reduce the risk of wildfires. Another example is the ExoWind project from National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Sandia Laboratory and Oak Ridge Laboratory. It creates a predictive physics-based simulation capability that provides a validated ground truth foundation for the siting and control of wind plants and the and uh, the reliable integration of wind energy into the grid. Because it turns out that wind energy, that turbines are affected by each other as well as weather patterns. So it's important to know that, to be able to model that when you site them. Um, so computational power, uh, modeling, science, and AI tools are a perfect trifecta for DOE to achieve our mission. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, some, of the some of the ways we're using AI to advance the DOE mission, um, advancing software development through DOE's uh, ex exascale, I can never say exascale, exascale computing project. We're developing the world's first capable exascale software ecosystem to drive breakthroughs in material science. Uh, AI, cancer research, earthquake risk assessment, energy production, storage, and computational weapons applications. You may also recall a few news articles about uh, people shooting at power stations. Somehow people think this is kind of fun. Um, uh, two people were arrested in 2023 for plotting an attack in Baltimore. Um, there was also a fairly um, uh, well-publicized attack in the desert uh, in Nevada. And so we have built a, a, an edge uh, computing platform um, based with uh, enabled by machine learning that allows us to detect gunshots. There are commercially enabled solutions, available solutions that do that. Um, but given the number of transformers there are in the country, um, that's not a viable solution. And so we've actually created something at DOE that you can literally put on a card and put out there. Uh, in addition, uh, National Labs are partnering to secure to develop secure AI and machine learning tools to detect and mitigate cyber attacks on power distribution systems and microgrids. Uh, this includes algorithm, de algorithm development, uh, test plan creation, and construction of a red team software environment. So imagine you're not just going to get attacked by the bad guys AI, you get attacked by the good guys AI too. Um, so that doesn't sound appealing? Okay. All right. Um, so I want to talk a little about the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, uh, which requires federal agencies to assess environmental impacts of their actions, including actions that require permitting. Um, DOE and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory are working on a pilot project to streamline and improve environmental permitting processes using AI. So the point of this project is that it takes a really long time to get approval for environmental pro for projects that have environmental impacts, and that includes things like getting power onto the grid. And so we have a huge backup of power people are trying to get onto the grid. Um, there's nearly as much power trying to come onto the grid as is on the grid now. And so by speeding up that environmental permitting process in conjunction with EPA, um, we can get power onto the grid. We can get other critical infrastructure projects out and about, out um, and into production sooner. Um, another project that you may not be aware of that was AI enabled at DOE um, was uh, that Argonne National Laboratory um, team with several academic institutions and hardware companies to develop an award-winning AI tool that helped us better understand the evolution and characterization of the COVID-19 virus. So there are no la there's absolutely no lack of uh, breathless media coverage on the risks of AI. Um, and you know we've had this unprecedented situation where some of the companies in the industry are asking to be regulated, which is not a common experience. Um, so it's not an understatement to say that there's lots we don't get know about the risks of AI. 
Um, but uh, that has not stopped. In fact, it's accelerated our progress uh, or our desire um, to get to work and prepare for the future. Uh, so the Biden-Harris administration is in the forefront in providing um, ethical and responsible practices in the AI industry um, to harness the full potential while keeping the public safe and individual rights protected. So um, one of the things the administration did was, of course, issue a uh, executive order 14.110, safe, secure, and trustworthy development. And the number one thing that did was get people to stop asking me for a little while about 14.038 or 28. Sorry, 28. Um, see, I can't remember the numbers of these things. Um, but the the uh, the um, MFA order and zero trust and all that good stuff. Um, so this document uh, lays out a whole of government approach to addressing AI's uh, potential promise and risks. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what DOE's done to address uh, the, the executive order. First of all, we've um, named both a chief AI, AI officer and a responsible AI officer. Um, and the last time I think I talked about AI in public, uh, I didn't name them because I wasn't sure they were public yet. And Jason's like, why won't you tell me? I'm like, I just don't know if they're public. Why won't you? Yes. Yeah, so Bridget Carper, as we all know now, is our responsible AI officer. Bridget's role is in my office is to be responsible for how we use AI at DOE. And then Helena Fu in the Office of Science is the chief AI officer. And her job is to uh, is responsible for how we do research and development in the AI space. So we partner together to ensure that DI, D, DOE's research and use of, of AI are both responsible. Um, and so we provide a lot of support in this space um, across DOE. Um, we provide access to DOE's national lab capabilities um, to folks outside of DOE. That's one of the things we do uh, as uh, on a general basis is we have what are called user facilities. And those are available to folks um, uh, who have a valid research need to use one of our computers. So the Summit Supercomputer at Oak Ridge uh, is actually the, um, the one uh, before Frontier, but is still widely available um, for folks to work on um, AI uh, work um, on this very AI capable computer. And Argon uh, at their lab has a test bed um, for the next generation research on AI accelerators. Um, in addition, my office uh, has been uh, creating uh, technical environments that people can work in. Um, and so we've created an AI discovery zone, um, which is a sandbox environment that folks within DOE can use um, to explore AI services and large language models. Um, for example, um, we're currently working on a prototype that involves developing an AI assistant that enables, uh, uh, simplifies the grant and funding scale, excuse me, funding search um, uh, for assistant for um, grants. So for example, if you, you're looking for an AI grant, or excuse me, if you're looking for a DOE grant, uh, but you don't exactly know which office is providing it or what you're looking for, this will help walk you through that grant uh, and, and process to help find what you're eligible for and what you can use. Um, so um, we're also providing guidelines and guardrails for use across DOE. Um, so um, we're the co-chair of the cross-departmental tiger team. So we developed a tiger team to identify um, how to use generative AI. We felt like we already had enough policies in place at DOE. So the issue was not let's create another policy, um, but really give people a handbook. How can they safely use generative AI? Um, and so my team, along with some folks from the Office of Science, put together this tiger team. And um, that tiger team has uh, had about 100 some 120 people, I think, on it from across DOE. We were able to gather what other parts of DOE were already doing. And then we built this reference guide used across DOE for people to be able to have sort of some guardrails on their work. Um, and that uh, uh, version one has been out for a while. Version two uh, is uh, in review internally. And we're sort of hopeful we'll actually be able to publish version two um, publicly um, once our attorneys uh, are satisfied. Um, so uh, cognizant of my time, how much time do I have left, Jason? Right underneath the thing. Oh, look at that. I've got one minute left. Yeah, so that went by real quick. So I want to jump forward a little bit and talk about, um, a, about quantum, um, because you didn't ask me to talk about quantum, so I always love to talk about something I wasn't asked to talk about. Um, 
But uh, quantum computing is going to be a huge deal. Uh, it's coming fast behind AI. It's got its own executive order, um, which makes sure you know it's a big deal. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the exciting thing about quantum is it's going to really enable us to accelerate the clean energy transition. Uh, and so if you think about uh, the ability to select um, uh, substrates for uh, solar panels, to select uh, battery composition materials, to select materials to sequester um, uh, carbon, all of those things we're going to be able to do better when we have quantum models. So AI models have improved the ability to select materials. If you look at some work p and and Microsoft did together, unselected materials for batteries, they were able to do about two decades worth of work in um, a very short period of time, a few weeks, and we'll be able to accelerate that even further with quantum. And so, um, you know, I think if we're our, our best chance uh, to, to keep, you know, the environment below 1.5 C of climate change um, is from uh, both AI, quantum, and the use of our existing uh, supercomputers to get us there. Um, so I just want to, wrap up by saying um, really we need all these technologies but we need the workforce so we can't get there without a strong workforce uh, that's talented and capable and we need to look past the traditional folks we look to for our workforce um, beyond that into non-traditional workforce um, and so we at Dewey are looking at how we can bring in uh, a diverse workforce that looks like America to meet our AI uh, needs and our quantum needs and our security needs and all those things going forward. So on that note, I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll pass it back to you, Jason. Oh, we're taking questions? Yes. Okay. Okay. Still my mic. Hi, Anne. It's Natalie. I'm over at NextGov. I was curious if you run into risk aversion at all at DOE when it comes to using AI and generative AI. Risk aversion in the government? <laughs> um, well, actually, you know, what's interesting is our, our labs don't really act a lot like the government uh, in that way. Uh, our researchers act more like uh, academics than they do like the government. So we have sort of two, two places. We've got a bunch of folks at headquarters who tend to be fairly nervous about new technology. Um, and so our lawyers like to think about everything really carefully, um, but the labs are gonna be full speed ahead. So in some ways it balances itself fairly nicely. All right, another question? Oh, there we go. Nope, oh, my mic, tell me who you are. No, nope, still my mic, oh. tell me who you are. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm Anne Tule and I'm from the Space Force. I'm actually now tagging on to the other young lady's question there. Uh, when it comes to using generative AI for high impactful, high risk um, projects or uh, you know assets, I am very happy to see that DOE is moving forward with it. At the same time, are you generating your own data for this AI to be writing on? Are you trusting the commercial data that is out there? So, um, yeah, so it's an interesting question. So, there, so the way that, you know, we don't work in DOE on pub, fully public models. So we may ingest data from a public model, um, but then, uh, you know, and, and a, a trained model, but then we're going to, nothing we put in that model is going to go back out. So, um, so yeah, the question becomes, are they trained on good data? And that's always a question. I think that you're gonna see a number of models within DOE, right? You're gonna see, hey, we've got this, this model that we brought inside that was based on original public model, like hey, there's a chat GPT version we brought inside, we're using it and our data is not going back out. But I think over time, what you'll see is some of our labs training their own models uh, very specifically on their scientific and research data. So you could imagine, um, creating a large language model that's really focused around a particular area of physics research or a particular area of cybersecurity research or whatever that stays within your lab team um, and learns from that. So I think, I mean, I think there's some interesting future uses uh, of, of large language models that we haven't really fully explored. All right, we'll do one more. All the way in the corner, look at that. You get your exercise. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I heard there's dessert more, more dessert out there. All right, let me know who you are. 
Hi, Anne. I'm Nate Bochamp with GovPlace. Um, it's a pleasure meeting you. I actually, I live in Oak Ridge across the street from Ornell. So I, I work with DOE and a lot of HPC initiatives. Um, one thing that I'm noticing from a lot of these conversations at different labs that have these supercomputers um, is they're trying to strategize about, you know, the, the, the supercomputer of tomorrow. There's a lot of constraints that come with these HPC initiatives, right? You have space, you have um, energy, right? Um, what it's funny, what at the you mentioned NREL, one of their pain points is trying to make energy efficient, uh, high performance computing environment. Can you share a little bit about sort of where do you think this is going to go in the future? Is, is multi cloud going to be a part of that? What do you think? Yeah, that's a super question. Um, and uh, so first of all, NREL's, NREL's supercomputer is almost, almost carbon neutral. In fact, some days it is better than than, uh, than, 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 than neutral because uh, they put the waste heat back into the building to heat the building. So they do some really cool things um, to be as energy efficient as possible. I shouldn't say carbon neutral, I said energy efficient. Sorry, I've got carbon neutrality on the brain today. Um, but it's extremely energy efficient. It's one of the most energy efficient supercomputers in the world right up there with Oak Ridge. Um, that said, um, I think that there's a there's an all of the above future. So um, we have two types of leadership computing we do. We have capacity and capability. And our capability of computing, like at Oak Ridge, is designed to advance the state of the art of high performance computing. And um, to me, by definition, we need to do that work ourselves. And not and now we do that in conjunction with vendors. We don't build the supercomputer in our in our soldering chips onto boards in the back room, but we need to be leading that then that to lead that that means it needs to be in our facility in partnership with the vendor but we do a lot of capacity work in in, in high performance computing much of which is already done in the cloud and some of these on-premise clouds uh, some on-premise um, high performance computers um burst into the cloud now so you might not even know that you're actually working in the on-premise computer or in the cloud um so there's a lot of opportunities in our labs that's the great thing about having so many of them and with all with their own ideas about how the world works, they're all doing different things. They're all heading in different directions with this. And some of them are going cloud, some of them are going hybrid, and some of those, particularly those that are doing cap capability building, are staying on premise. Okay. All right. Well, let's give Anne a round of applause. Thanks, Jason. Well done. Um, we have another panel coming up, so uh, don't go anywhere. Um, and Anne, I don't know if you can have a minute or two to stick around just in case. For like you said, folks. But let's get the panel. Natalie, this is your panel. So, uh, hey, guess what I have? I have more trivia while your panel comes on stage. So, why don't you invite them up? All right. So, I have uh, this is was a generative AI panel. And this is difficult because, uh, Tim, will you get that clicker going? Change it up. Um, this is difficult because I'm like, okay, how much? Oh, we're we supposed to go to Emerging Tech Talk. Is that what it is? Oh, I blew it. Sorry. Hold your panel. Hold your panel. Let's do the Emerging Tech Talk instead. That's why I have Tim here. No, no, take your time. Richard from Uncork is going to be our Tech Talk. Richard, thank you. So, hi, Lord. Yeah, no, I'm good. So, uh, so I'm Richard Robinson. I am head of solutions at a place called Uncork. Uh, for those of you who don't know Uncork, we are uh, a codeless platform. Sorry, I should believe. There we go. So the reason why we call ourselves codeless is because we feel like code has a problem, especially when it comes to AI and using Gen AI. It's one thing to create models. It's one thing to be able to use what's out there in the commercial ecosystem. It's another thing to actually be able to deploy it to your end users and have your end users actually use it. They don't want to swivel chair. They don't want to go to the AI, then come back to their job. They don't want to um, sort of learn a new system. Instead, we believe in embedding AI as part of your application. But when you're building just applications, you're constantly translating. You're constantly taking requirements, turning them into the tech require tech spec, that could turns into code, that then goes back to the non-tech users. That's not what they wanted, that's not what they envisioned. Um, and so we're trying to get rid of that in the same way that we got rid of mainframe servers, in the same way that we created API to create common services. 
let's take away the code base because we haven't really done anything new in code, right? We just do the same 40 or 50 functions. We do decisions, we do calculations, we move data around, we put stuff on screen. And so being able to move to a codeless framework allows you to focus more on function and focus less on having to update the code base when the next Angular goes to uh, get antiquated or the next .NET application or COBOL application got bid, uh, you know, becomes antiquated and we can't change it because no one knows COBOL anymore. So it becomes uncorked responsibility to change the code base. You create function and you're effectively just defining what your application does without compromising what applications do. And this is where Gen AI really comes into play because not only can we use Gen AI to migrate, but we can also use Gen AI to incorporate part of the process that you would build in an application, add AI to it. behind the scenes, maybe. maybe it's just providing insights. Maybe it's front and center. Hey, help me generate a letter or doing anything in between. Overall, Codeless allows you to really focus on a lot of the different ownership of your application. So don't think you've got to go use a proprietary low code thing that you're going to be stuck in their way of doing code. You can't transition. We fully intend for you to either like Uncork or we would intend for you to go take the IP and go somewhere else with it. So let us prove the value. We're also very extensible. We realize we're never going to have every operation. You're never going to develop a, an LLM in Uncork. You're going to develop it somewhere else. So let us integrate into that. Whether you're using the third-party source, whether you're developing your own LLM, just, just create a REST API. And then a REST API can be used anywhere it needs to be and can be used in a single application. So overall, and I'm going to demonstrate some of this, which is why I'm sort of going through slides because I hate using slides. Um, you know, the things that really the thing about with Gen AI adoption today, what is... Um, not necessarily low risk, but what is proven both in the commercial side and the private side and the public side of use cases for AI that can help you modernize your mission. You know, accelerate legacy migrations from old applications that you're managing code bases, you're almost scared to touch them because they're fragile. You can move them to a codeless application, lower the TCO, lower that uh, the, the, the need to constantly learn how to, to update that code base. Smart assistants, understanding what to do next. Take a bunch of data. What should I look at? What are some of the trends? And also injects that AI into the application to just make that workflow better. So let's get out of Slideware and go into our platform because I think our platform is the most important part. And of course, this is sharing a little on the screen. So let's do this. Hopefully this changes over. So what happens when you use your own laptop? There we go. So back into what we mean by using Codebase. This is all drag and drop. I take anything that I want, drag and drop it on the screen, define what it is, instantly render. The idea behind this as well is that you can drive things like 508 compliance through this platform as well making sure that all the different applications are, oh, this thing hates me, doesn't it? <laughs> Driving 508 app, um, you know, mobile response, make sure that you can use this out in the field, making sure that you can use this for any application where you need to have high visibility, need to have um, different types of applications where you need to make sure that everybody can access it from an, from an ADA perspective, from just a mobile device perspective, all of this can be done that way. Now, if I switch back into the application, what I can do is start to build this idea of approved Gen, I, Gen AI snippets. So maybe I'm collecting information and I wanna use things like document AI or an OCR intelligent reader to read a driver's license and pull information so I can verify it's correct. I can pull that in and instantly do this and test that application, make sure that my non-technical, my business or my um, agencies agree with, this is exactly how I want it to look and feel. Maybe I want to see the mobile experience. Maybe I want to render it that way. I can do that as well and reload that in the mobile experience. So this becomes a great way to have that iterative feedback loop, making sure that every single time I'm doing something new to the application, I'm focusing on that function, focusing on making sure we're building exactly what we want to spec. Now let's move back into the uh, designer mode. Maybe I want to add more AI to this. Maybe I want to add a letter generator and be able to swap this in and out with uh, different types of prompts, different types of AI. Maybe we're using ChatGPT now, we're using Gemini in the future, 
maybe we create our own within the agency and I want to swap that out. Every time you do that, you're just configuring what that endpoint looks like. And this is the advantage of no code or a, a codeless framework versus using uh, a code framework where I have to go dig into the code, rip it out, regression test it. This is all is done through a configuration platform. So now when I save and preview this, I've just built something from, had something and turned it into an application where I have effectively this Gemini code. What happens if you don't save something? Hit preview. Go to the flow again. So we're going to go ahead and upload. And now if I want to write a letter, I have this piece right below here that's generating things from AI, from my large language. So this is how easy it is to start getting Gen AI into your application. This is how easy it is using the codeless framework to focus less on, is this Python, is this .NET, is this Node.js? I don't care anymore. I just care about my endpoint, making the user experience. And if I want to swap it out in the back end, I can do that in this little five seconds. So hopefully that kept me on time, but otherwise I'll happy to take questions. Yes. Yeah, so so BlackRock is a great example. BlackRock is one of our very early clients. They were able to deliver applications three times faster. They were able to lower their total cost of ownership by 65% because they're not having to go back in and keep the lights on and spend a bunch of budget to update code bases, update change Angular to React type of frameworks. They're spending more time using the component library that we've already built and have it replicating 99% of what they do. You just, you know, a case statement, an if statement, go to this page, show this message on screen. We do the same mundane 40 to 50 things in, in uh, code if you really think about it. So we've taken all those and componentized it. So that way it gives you the ability to really just say drag and drop, here's a decision table. If these things happen, do these five things. It doesn't have to be a giant piece of code that no one's documented. I'm a former developer. I never documented anything. Um, have it basically self-document in, in a system that anyone can easily read and understand what that application does five years from now when they need to update. And my mic, that you can talk into it. Okay. Are you fed ramped and can you talk about your State Department uh, implementation? Certainly, yes. We are a federal moderate, uh, and we are at the Department of State doing things like scheduling for embassies and, and refugee apps, things that have to be deployed in 30 days, things that have to be deployed lightweight within small IT departments within a specific consulate or embassy, and applications that are portable between uh, different embassies as well. So it's a way to not only, and we talked about that with you know, a little bit with owning your IP, owning the application. You can take that application and put it anywhere else within the Uncoin framework. It doesn't have to just live in that one place. I can separate the database from the uh, application itself and take my Vietnam application and take it to me to uh, the Netherlands and, and, and modify it for that. All right, last one. We gotta get to the panel that I've, uh, they've been waiting on me for like, <laughs> they're like, damn, just, <laughs> yeah, there you go, Omar, you know. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, can you just a little bit briefly describe your API platform, like an integration to other product? I mean, does it come with Uncore or we, do we have to make something available? So so our entire app, our entire integration strategy is REST API. We can use SFTP, we can create other adapters as well, but REST API across the board. What we're trying to do is not have an adapter strategy where you have to create a special adapter that only works with Uncore and until then, you know, your, 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 your DOA. Instead, what you're going to do is just have a REST API somewhere. We'll read directly into that API using those credentials. And that way you have full control over the AI. We don't want to create AI. We're not, it's not our competency. And there will be a hundred firms between now and the end of the year that will pop up and do, do a, um, AI. They'll also leapfrog each other every six months. There'll be a new one that comes out. You'll create your own. There'll be 
some new technology we've never even heard of in this room today that will be here. We'll talk about it next year. Um, we want to make sure we're compatible with all of those, and REST API is the common denominator across the board, which is why we read into every single one. All right, let's give Richard a round of applause. Nice job. And we got the laptop to work. All right. Uh, let's, oh, now's the panel. Now's the panel. Still not there, but, but I'm gonna, you're good. <laughs> We're going to switch out the laptop. And then the panelists, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take the stage. And uh, I will do more trivia. Now I'm ready for my Gen AI. Going back to the beginning, Gen AI trivia is actually very difficult to find because there was actually uh, someone had, said something about, oh, the one year anniversary of ChatGPT, but then I was like, uh, is that really trivia? Does anyone really pay attention? But I did find some, so I'm excited. <clears throat> and, and this goes back to something that was said earlier this morning. So uh, uh, we know about data, a lot of data being, that's really the generation, that, that's what generates the, the AI to work well. So how many open data sets are there currently on data.gov? Number of data sets on data.gov. Give me a number, yes. 10,000, too small. Anyone else? Billions, to, not, not open ones. All right, one more, one more guess. Anyone, no one? 50,000, all right. 291,791. Uh, now, why am I asking that, you ask? Because that's a great question. Uh, because the Commerce Data Governance Board launched the AI and Open Government Data Assets Working Group in January. And that working group will draft technical guidelines for publishing AI-ready open data will engage industry, academia, other partners. This is led by consensus chief scientist, Sally Ann Keller, and it's made up of data management and AI experts across the commerce's 13 bureaus. And they will publish, this is the key here, guidelines by the end of 2024, this working group that will help you take that open data and make it ready for AI and specifically generative AI. So that being said, Natalie, it's all you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, hello, everyone. I hope we're all feeling awake after lunch. I know it always helps me. So thank you for sticking around. My name's Natalie. I'm a reporter at NextGov, and I'm happy to be moderating this panel. My esteemed panelists, I believe we have one who is coming in online. So if a mysterious Zoom screen pops up, do not be afraid. That is supposed to be there. But let's get started now. I'm going to pull a question out of Jason Miller's book, actually. And I want to start with asking you guys if you would maybe share something about generative AI that you think people don't know or get wrong when they talk about generative AI. I don't know who wants to go first. And if you'll share who you are and where you work uh, as you answer, that would be great. I guess we can all go right to le left, right to left, right? Um, so I think the one thing folks don't understand from my perspective about generative AI, it's just probabilities. You know, it's the, the seed word with the probability of what's the next word with the compounded probability, what's the word behind it? So it's uh, not very, you know, um, what I'd like to say is it's something that, if you believe it makes sense, it makes sense, but it's just a probabilistic combination of words that seems to re resonate and there's no magic behind it. It's just probabilities. I'm Mike Sanders and I'm with Net Documents. And for me, um, I think the output is only as good as the input. And people, the more they use it, they are starting to understand that but a lot of people who are still new to generative AI don't quite get that and can be surprised and be surprised quite a bit. Hi, I'm Hala Nelson. I am a professor of mathematics, the only academic here, I think. Um, I think what people get wrong is that they think it's more capable than it currently is. They think that, oh, it, I'm gonna get AI to do this for me, to do that for me a while. All of these technologies are still maturing and they don't apply to their own data. They apply to some, if they just grab a model, it's not gonna give them what they want immediately. And they have to kind of tame these probabilities um, with determinism from under the model with like search-like processes and on top of the model with knowledge graphs. 
So when they have that ready, then they can start getting what they want from generative AI, but they have to invest in that. Hi, I'm Kimberly Himes. I am with the Department of Health and Human Services. I am one of those contracting officer folks. So shout out to my friends over there. Um, so I am actually um, the director for the Strategic Acquisition Innovation Lab, focusing on acquisition innovation. So I think one of the big things going on right now in the realm that I'm in is one kind of like what they said, right? Like the understanding and recognizing that it's it's not here to like take your job and the same time it's a it's a tool right so like how to add something to our toolbox both for the acquisition workforce but also then how do we help all of our colleagues that are trying to buy it buy it at a speed that works for the the current environment which we weren't really fast before um so trying to get faster is is one of those elements how can we kind of make this process of purchasing across government whatever it is better but then especially looking at the dynamic nature of it and how how it's picking up speed and we weren't necessarily staying up before and like now we have to get even faster right like you're you're chasing it so how can we how can we catch up how can you catch up so I think in terms of in terms of my 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 area that I'm looking at is helping the acquisition workforce understand number one the tools that are out there. So um, if folks are familiar with the DHS pill, their procurement innovation lab, um, basically that has done such great things that they're looking at it as a best practice and expanding it across government. So I am the I am the HHS rendition. Um, so we are, I, I joined HHS in October. Um, I am a recovering operational contracting officer, um, did that for uh, 13 years, and uh, then switched into workforce and policy side and now innovation, because I see an opportunity to help not just my former colleagues that I worked with directly in the 1102 field, but also, you know, having functioned as a PM on the policy side, having functioned as a core, like I've, I've kind of I've lived the pain, I've felt the pain, right? Like having all of these different hats and all these opportunities, bringing that perspective and looking at, okay, for acquisition innovation, like the pill originally started looking at that 1102 community and then gradually over time realized, okay, we need to incorporate OGC. We need to start talking to PMs. We need to start talking to cores, right? Because everything from requirements development and how we can speed that up how we can make sure we're getting the requirements right the first time, which is a priority for this administration. And, and I think has been a priority. It's It's been a known issue for a long time, but now seeing it kind of become a priority and figuring out, okay, how do we do that? As well as the engagement with industry, right? Like I know when I started my career, this whole idea of like talking with industry was was just becoming a thing. And like the I would say the the folks that I came in under were like, do you want to talk to industry? <gasps> right? Like the first time I ever threw out the idea of like affordability language and like sharing like a number, like I, I sprouted a second head there for a moment. Like that that contracting officer that I was working with was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if we've only got $4.5 million to spend, we should probably tell them that. Like, so that they don't come in on September 28th with like a six million dollar bid. I mean, just saying, right? And and like so, this idea of kind of changing the mindset, changing the approach, and and really looking at how can we partner, breaking down the whole like, well, this is how we've always done it. Like heard that multiple times during my career. Like, oh, you came from another agency. Well, that's not how we do it here. Well, maybe that other agency had some good ideas, right? Like. Like the idea of just creating this communication and sharing information and then incorporating kind of new ways of doing things to to speed up the process on the spot consensus, right? Like we had someone this morning talking about how from like July to January, right? Like, like obviously we do need to dot our I's and cross our T's and, and the protest process is kind of a check and balance and holds us accountable, but it doesn't need to like grind everything to a halt. And we need to make sure that that we're using the right tool for the job. So kind of looping back around with 
AI is not going to solve all of our problems. It's not the like, we just need an AI and, and, and then that will make everything better. It's, well, if you put it in the wrong place, it's just gonna cause you more problems. So kind of working with folks to kind of understand where the benefits are, where we can use it, the existing just technical things that we can do in the acquisition process to speed things up and, and really just communicating across within HHS, across our operational divisions, interagency, right? Like the intra-agency, interagency, across to industry, like just opening these lines of communication is kind of, is, is where I'm starting, right? So like the idea of let's let's talk and let's share. Kingdom building is is not necessarily the answer, like holding all the power close, like knowledge is power, sharing it, right? We get this synergy. So trying to make that difference and and get things moving. You know, I will figure out, yeah, there you go. So I just appreciate everything you just said because, you know, I'm a, you know, I sort of look at myself as a problem solver in government, right? Not a, you know, I'm this role or that role. And every successful project that I've had requires partnerships with contracting officers, requires partnerships with our budget folks, requires, you know, really uh, partnership with our HR folks. Without that, it doesn't work. And, you know, even when I look at careers, you know, this, when we talk about generative AI versus, you know, a traditional tech career, I now actually prefer to have folks, you know, with a limited tech background, who I think end up being better hires for generative AI, as opposed to, you know, a technocrat, just because the work with generative AI has been so abstracted. And, you know, the type of thinking that I need from folks is, that we are no longer looking at a career ladder. So it's not like you, you, you know, just to use a um, contracting parlance, you know, you start as a, you know, junior, and then you become a, you know, a, a contracting officer, then you get a bigger warrant, then you get an unlimited warrant, and then you supervise a bunch of contractors, then you become chief procurement officer. There's that, you know, career ladder that you sort of follow. And in the budget space, you sort of do the same thing, you know, budget analyst, uh, supervisor to, you know, the guy who does the appropriations account to, you know, budget director, but we need a lattice. I need people that can jump in from procurement to budget to IT to requirements, you know, and have a lattice along the way. So you no, no longer need to move up. You could move sideways. You could move laterally. You could, you know, you could move at an angle up. You could even go down sideways and then up there's no one right way to get to where you need to go and it's the right fit so folks that get hung up in being in a ladder those are like the worst folks you know it, i need them to understand they're in the lattice and that what i need from them is this on-demand fractional talent so i don't need them to you know work on a problem all the time i need to i need them to work on multiple problems for part of the time and if they're not adaptable they could work in other couple of great fields, but they won't be successful in this new field of generative AI, where we look at things like prompt engineering, where the best people I've found at prompt engineering are folks with a liberal arts degree, not with a technical degree. So thank you. Tina, are you there? I am. I actually can hear you now, but I didn't hear whatever question you asked. All right. I think we can hear you now. Do you have anything to add uh, about all these generative AI things we're chatting about? I think that one thing that, thing that um, um, keeps coming up uh, is, is more about um, the threat to national security and that AI will, will be this threat to national security. And I think AI could be used both for good and bad. Um, and I'm hoping that the government really kind of figures out that piece of it, uh, that AI could help us with national security. Um, and it's important to have like safeguards in place to prevent AI from being harmful in many ways. Uh, I think some of the things that was said before too, was having people who are not necessarily um, IT background come in and help us to 
really diversify AI, um, but to also find things that we weren't thinking about before. Um, and I think this is kind of that part from a national security standpoint. People who are not necessarily in the day to day from an AI or even an IT perspective will help us to see things that we weren't able to see clearly um, ourselves. But I also think that the a big part, uh, and I think Kim talked about it, was uh, AI coming in and taking over our jobs. And I, I will, I really will say that AI is going to create more jobs um, than it is going to kind of destroy them. I think it is important to have workers that are skilled in AI, but also people who are just going to test AI from a DEIA standpoint, um, and also who are just going to be looking at it for, from an ethical use perspective. Great. Dr. Nelson, I know you wanted to get in here. Oh, I, I wanted to um, second the requirement of breadth of knowledge in people getting into this, and I, I couldn't highlight it more. It's uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, the data engineering, the people who with tech background, you can tell even now we just saw a demonstration like their jobs are becoming automated and then it's what we build on top of that that's becoming important in how we advance the field or what we want to do with this Gen AI. And in that sense, you need way more knowledge and tech knowledge. And I wanted to second that. Excuse me. So she mentioned that one of the fears, and, and I actually have seen this, one of the fears is people were thinking, oh, AI is going to take my job. My job is in jeopardy. As AI has rolled out, now all of a sudden it's, wait, AI isn't smart enough to do my job, and they're mad. And so you want your cake and they eat it too. And I find that very interesting. The other thing that I've, that I've heard as I've gone around speaking with people is it's not that AI is going to take our jobs. It's people who know how to use AI are going to take the jobs of people who don't know how to use AI. And so the use of AI and learning how to use it in a responsible and ethical way becomes that more key. And we're starting to see degrees pop up that are focused on how to use an AI. We see companies, we see other entities and organizations sending employees out to how to use AI to just upskill and become more familiar with generative AI in general. I think like adding on to that and, and what Gina has said, the idea of like, right, like a brick is a brick. You can use a brick to build a hospital or you can throw a brick through a window. Like the brick is still just a brick and it's what you do with it. The same thing. If, if you've got a bunch of bricks, but you don't know if you're not a brick mason, you, you can't do a lot with it. So the idea of looking at at something that is inanimate essentially and and a, a thing and then figuring out how to work with it what to do with it is what you're doing with it good or bad or better or worse and and i think sometimes just the kind of like that ooh of of ai we we kind of almost get intimidated by right when it's still just a thing where do we go from here so, you know, I really wanted to pull on a thread, you know, that Sheena started is this DEI space, you know, and I know it gets very tricky out there, right, in this climate. And, you know, the idea, you know, when we think about generative AI, it's a fresh start. And for me, you know, when I think about the engineering pipelines for traditional IT jobs. You know, you had to have a certain math background, certain math courses, whatnot. Then you go to a coding boot camp and you do this and you do that and you learn the language and you know you do a couple of things. But along the way, as we have generative AI now, where those things have gotten abstracted, you know, it's like the 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 database administrator, that job really doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's gone away, but people have done other things. And with generative AI, now you have folks that were traditionally not represented in technology have a great opportunity to get represented in technology. And it's how do we leverage that? So, you know, and I've talked about this before is that even what I like to do is look for people that 
don't are not from the typical mold of a technologist. And those are the folks that I find succeed in generative AI. So, you know, the marginalized candidates, they bring a very unique perspective to this space. And that kind of, even when we think about prompt engineering, right? Right, finding that seed song from Pandora that makes your playlist magic, or that, you know, that seed question that gets you to the answer that you need faster, you find that from, a lot of times a perspective from a marginalized or, you know, from a candidate that comes in or a, uh, an employee that comes in from a marginalized or, you know, disadvantaged background because they bring a different perspective. You know, it's like if you, uh, you know, bring in somebody that is a traditional engineer, they'll just want to throw more horsepower at it. But other folks, you know, that don't come from that background, that resource rich background, I find that a lot of times they end up being more creative. So generative AI is, is an opportunity for me to help build a next generation team that looks different, that thinks different, that can harness the power that we traditionally would not be able to if we just kept on going in the same wells. So uh, thank you, Sheena, for raising that. You're not on my panel tomorrow on tech talent, but I wish I could add you. I don't think I have that authority here, but that would be nice. Um, you know, I want to ask, um, Kimberly, you talked sort of about the ooh factor with generative AI. So I want to sort of ground us with the question of what are we actually using generative AI for, if anything? Um, Sheena, if you're still there, I'd love to start with you and what you're seeing at, uh, in your agency. Yes. Um, so actually, NARA has started a couple of pilots with generative AI. We are looking at how we can improve our catalog. So we have the National Archives catalog, and I implore all of you to go out there and, and take a look at the catalog and help us to make it better. We have a um, survey that we're asking people right now if they are able to find the documents that they're looking for. Uh, and that's kind of where this AI space really helps us is because we're we're partnering with other agencies as 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 we get more familiar with AI and and how we can share some lessons learned with other agencies. So we're looking at cognitive search within um, or semantic search within our National Archives catalog. We're also looking at seeing how we can uh, utilize AI to help us with assisted description. Um, so we have records that we need to describe and we put them in our catalog. So we're, we're doing a pilot with that. We're also looking at how um, we can do PII detection. Uh, so there are things on our National um, Archives catalog that may have PII data in it. And, and so we want to make sure that before we publish anything to our um, websites or anything that's out there in the public, that we are reviewing it from a PII perspective. Um, we also are partnering with a couple other agencies and organizations to do a FOIA um, assisted um, assistant. So uh, looking for how we could do really access review and redaction for different um, records as well. Uh, so we, we have uh, lots of pilots. We also have our use cases for AI on our website. Uh, um, you can go to archives.gov and our AI use cases are out there. But I, I mean, one of the big things um, that I'm that I'm seeing is really how do we utilize these pilots to help us to engage our union as well as our workforce and come up with rules of engagement. Uh, one of the big things for AI, and we really haven't really talked about it quite yet, is really the, the cultural changes and the change management strategy that we're gonna have to go through um, as we, we roll out these systems. One of the big things that we talked about is, um, is AI gonna take over my job uh, or help me to do my job faster? When we get to supervisors, uh, one of the big things that we, we want to be able to do is have, um, yes, my use of AI as transparent as possible that I created this email utilizing AI. Um, and, and that it's not a bad thing is that that productivity and helps us to free us up to do more things. And I, I think that's kind of that, that cultural aspect uh, where, you know, and I think that as um, Microsoft is going to be rolling out Copilot, uh, at which is going to integrate into your Microsoft products, that those conversations about the workforce and the culture is going to be ones that we, we really kind of lean in heavy on. 
Great. Any of my panelists have anything to add on how you're using generative AI or that culture piece that uh, Sheena was just talking about? So I think earlier kind of was mentioned that HHS has a lot of AI use cases out there, but in terms of from the acquisition perspective, right, we're we're just starting to look at kind of how how we can use this, where it's most appropriate. Um, I think over the last few years in the like actual acquisition shops, 1102 kind of workforce area, the idea like of of bots and things is just kind of starting like, so funny enough, the people that spend the money, it doesn't seem like we have much um, to get stuff for ourselves, right? So, um, so the idea of what kind of tools and things does the acquisition process need and then tying into that culture change, right? So even something as simple as there are a number of contractor responsibility determination bots out there where um, there it's a mechanism that essentially the bot goes out to sam.gov and brings back the information that's in there. And in talking with folks, like there is there is some resistance in the community in terms of being willing to like, email a bot and get that back versus someone being like, well, no, I want to go in and pull it because I'm responsible for the determination and I want to make sure that I'm finding the right information, right? Like this kind of resistance to change as well as um, just the the idea of risk, like contracting tends to be very risk averse. Um, so the idea of being able to effectively assess risk, what what is the level of risk of a protest for this particular procurement that's out there, that sort of thing. So kind of working with an already kind of overtaxed workforce to be like, listen, if we can save you six minutes a day, that's a half an hour a week, right? Like the idea of how do we present this and kind of change manage this in a way that that makes it a positive as opposed to the whole like they're here for my job so i'm uh, sponsoring a couple of gen ai use cases in my agency as well as proofs of concept so proofs of concept not live just throwing that out there um, so um one of the things that we are looking at is you know, because we are in a uh, highly regulated environment, pipelines and hazardous materials, is how do we ensure we have both humans in the loop and humans on the loop? So really as part of our exploration and our proofs of concept is what tasks are better suited for narrow AI and what tasks are better suited for generative AI? And especially, you know, uh, you talked about, you know, going to sam.gov and doing a couple of things. That's RPA. You know, uh, there are certain other things uh, where, uh, you know, we have commodity chatbots. I need the phone number for the local regional office. Just type it right there, get it right back, you know, plain English, as opposed to three links deep into the website. So there's commodity there already that's doing it really well. RPA, chatbots, things like that. But where you come, you know, to generative AI, the kind of framework I've laid out for my staff is what would you have an eighth grader do? And what would you have like a high school senior do? And, you know, that's kind of like determines what level of risk they're trying to take. So you say, would you have an eighth grader do this? Then why do you think it's okay for a generative AI model to do this. And we can have that discussion. But the framework is really going back to risk. It goes back to how do we ensure that for decision-making, it's a human making the decision, not a, a model, right? And how do we distinguish that? So how do we you know, seg separate or abstract the staffing of the problem with the solving of the problem. So you say, you know, would you have an intern go and pull all the different files, you know, and put them in one package and maybe even do a little bit of research and say, in the past, you have approved similar applications, right? There's good, you can verify and you can say, yeah, I agree. You know, would you have, you know, a high school intern maybe write a summary of what's in the file? and put it as a cover memo for you. So that it maybe you you go in and spot check if you need, 
right? But would you have them do that? And maybe that cuts down on what you are trying to do. You know, and as your, you know, interns get better, maybe you have them write a summary of the proposal, like a draft response, right? But we're not there yet. How do you tie in all these things so that, you know, the transactional and the cognitive aspects are clearly separated and delineated. And that's where, you know, we see, uh, you know, our generative AI journey, but it's still a journey. We're still probably in my mind where we have a bunch of eighth grade interns that I'd have them do certain things, but I still need a lot of humans in the loop. And those humans are not going away for a very long time. It's just that the type of things I need them to do now is empathy, communication, you know, bot management. Those are the kind of things I need them to do all in the furtherance of government service so that we're getting responses back to our customers faster, right? More volume, more thoughtful response. Thanks. Dr. Nelson, yes, let's go to you. Um, yeah, what I've seen throughout my counseling um, is that uh, AI is, uh, uh, is used in different contexts depending on who the department is and what level of the organization is. So um, always like grounding it in the context uh, has been beneficial. What I've seen is a range. I've seen people just experimenting with like, say they have Microsoft is approved, then they're just playing around with a built-in new co-pilot. I've seen that. I've seen people dump data sets, like one data set and do something with it because we need to answer this one question. So it's a one-time use thing but on multiple uh, problems. Um, and I've seen, uh, I've seen it also whenever it's about a strategy and pushing their strategy down on organization, there's always the issue of the culture and change and people have to kind of give up data or, or control over data. So it always ends up being a data governance issue whenever it's about a full organization strategy. And um, what I've learned uh, is that a lot of, um, to, to do this data governance um, change, who owns the data, what does this data mean, what does this column, how does it map to the business closely? I've noticed that a lot of it is right now happening, but manually, like people, humans are sitting down and talking about these things and labeling them, creating these metadata and, and organizing it manually. So I was impressed in how much of this work is still manual. Hopefully it will be automated because it has an amazing potential, but that's where I've seen things at throughout the organizations I've worked with, including my university government, transportation, fire department, department of state, DOD. I've, I've seen this like range. Mike, do you have anything to add? I do actually. Um, you know, I've I I do assist with some of our our government entities. I also assist in the commercial world as well. And looking at how generative AI is actually used there is it's it's been proven out. It's it's used quite a bit to let's say you get this five hundred page report. Well, can you please summarize that for me? Right and. AI reads so much faster than what we do. And to be able to comprehend that, or, hey, I just received this correspondence. I would love to create some response without having to read and go research and do this. And so being able to use generative AI to already know the issues and even being able to train and teach the AI with my prior examples, here's my voice, here's how I speak, to then generate that letter as if I were the one who wrote it. But I can't stress enough with what has been said here multiple times, human oversight is essential. Because in the end, we are liable, the AI is not. And yeah, I'm not gonna trust my future to AI just yet. So now when it can pick the winning lottery numbers, then I'm gonna trust my life to AI, but it's still far from there. Sheena, if you're still there, how are you sort of navigating the whole idea of a human in the loop um, at NARA? So something that someone on the panel has said, we're doing the same thing. Like the AI can uh, not stand on its own. I really like the suggestion to say, would you let an intern um, go off and do their own thing? 
And I think that that's, that's really a, a, a great way to look at it. Um, one of the things that we did was when we say the FOIA assisted tool is because it's assisting us in doing our jobs as well as the AI um, self, I mean, the AI um, assisted description. All of those things is, is really helping us um, and not necessarily taking over the job. And it definitely has to have humans in the loop. I'm also gonna say, and I wanna stress, stress, stress that ours are only pilots as well and that we are not in production with any um, AI right now and they are all pilots. And, and again, the reason why they're pilots is because we are engaging our workforce and our union and understanding acceptable uses, rules of engagement, and really to help us with that culture. I think the other part is we touched on cybersecurity in the beginning, but each year at my agency, I'm sure all of your agencies, um, we have to do cybersecurity training. Uh, even before you start here at the National Archives, we mandate that uh, you take cybersecurity training. I foresee that us, that our agencies will be doing the same thing with AI. It's really about the, the use of AI and how do we protect our agency's data. Um, this means not utilizing open generative AI solutions uh, like ChatGPT and, and putting your agency's private information, non-public information on something like ChatGPT and, and, and really kind of not using those type of, of services or not allowing the use of those type of services, but really explaining why. Uh, so we will um, be doing the, the very same thing in terms of doing training um, as we would for cybersecurity for AI. Uh, I think that the biggest thing is, and we talked about this too, is the cultural piece of it, is we're going to have to train our supervisors as well as our staff and their staff who, who wants AI to take over their job, right, um, so that they can get things done faster, is that, yeah, you probably will get things done faster, but you will always be in the loop. And, and that helps for people who are very nervous about AI taking over their jobs. Um, so it's really about that cultural piece and that mind shift um, that, that we have to make as uh, people who deploy AI, but also as um, supervisors who, who are working with our staff who are going to be utilizing AI in their day-to-day -day base, uh, their day-to-day -day work. Great. Well, I think we're going to go to questions because hopefully there are some people out there smarter than I am with better questions. All right. No pressure. No pressure, Sandy. Never any pressure. All right. No, uh, this is just a fun group here. So, uh, I'm going to focus back into the use cases and more importantly in use cases, because we all speak about everything looks like a nail. So let's talk about solutions. So if we can start on, uh, I guess, on your right with Neil, can you start talking about maybe use case and solutions as a library or a library for reuse across all government? So I'll say my perspective on that has evolved in the last couple of years, you know, as I've moved around a little more in, in the federal government, where, you know, I'm starting to recognize there's rational reasons why each agency has legislative autonomy and budgetary autonomy, right? Because their missions are different. There are many parametrically similar aspects to what they do, right, in terms of, you know, grants management or, you know, uh, responding to, you know, uh, customer requests, right, or enforcement or, you know, there are many parametrically similar things we do, but they're not the same. So, you know, use cases are great to learn from one another, but I'm starting to see why it's very challenging to take one solution and drop it into another organization without modification. So, you know, it's, a, but to that point, it's very, it's much better to start with the 80% solution than the 0% solution. And that's where use case libraries really come in. And it's how we share those use case libraries how we manage those use case libraries, because a library is like a, a vegetable garden. You know, you don't maintain it. All you get is weeds by year two, 
So, you know, it's how you manage it. It takes resources, how you collect a body of volunteers to do so. How do you do that? Those are all much larger issues. And that's why it's so hard because it does take resources. And, you know, we're tragedy of the commons. Everybody wants to like, you know, enjoy the view, but nobody wants to mow the grass, right? So two, two in a row and I'll pass it on. I can only speak from a use case perspective of organizations that actually use our software with the AI piece of it. And at this point, as we've heard, there are many government entities that are still kind of testing, piloting, and so aren't necessarily in a production environment yet. So my use cases are gonna be more from the commercial side, but we're looking at things like automatically extracting entities from documents, from contracts. When did it start? When did it end? What are early payment dates? And then actually doing analysis on top of that. So here's an employment agreement that I received. What are the risks as an employee? What risks does the company have? So now we're talking analysis or summarizing content, or here's an agreement compared against my gold standard. Does it have all of the clauses that I'm interested in? Are their terms equal or better than my terms? So it, it comes down to summarizing and analyzing this information in many cases more accurately than what I can do, much, much quicker, but at the same time, with me still having that oversight to fact check and verify that, okay, I did that correct. So those are just a handful of what I've seen. And actually, uh, uh, I would say we get another question because I know we're running short on time, but please go ahead. Oh yeah, um, what I wanted to add is uh, two things. Uh, the uh, the domain knowledge like um, is, um, uh, so use cases, um, okay, <laughs> domain knowledge, um, that, that idea left my head. But what I wanted to say is explainability. Part of the solution that has in the AI that you're using at some point has to be able to explain itself and how it arrived at its decision. So one of the biggest use cases of AI okay. is, and the most promise is the ability to talk to your data uh, instead, so you're removing the engineer in the middle, you're removing the analyst in the middle. The decision maker is probably Ask, asking for the data and for the report and for the comparisons all at the same time. And then if the AI responds to you that way uh, and there's an auditing, there's compliance, there's regulation, the AI has to be able to explain how it arrived at this decision. So part of the solution, in my opinion, to trust AI and make its use uh, broad is also building the explainability in, and that's uh, and there's a lot of work in that direction that's uh, becoming more mature. I think I have one time, one more. One, tell me who you are and your question. Yeah, my name is uh, Stefano Coronado. I work for the Navy. So I guess my real question goes around like, where do you draw the line between you know, with you, know, you guys are in management in your respective uh, orgs. And where do you draw the line really between, you know, having, you know, skill versus, you know, depending too much on AI? Because I've seen, you know, GPT write really, really ridiculously, you know, stupid code for with respect to, you know, give it a sample prompt and see what happens. So. <laughs> there is no line. No, I mean, the line for me is, am I signing that document or am I not signing that document? on the on the mysterious zoom i don't know if you heard that question and if you have any thoughts i did hear that question and and i agree it's it's more can i sign it from a authority to operate kind of perspective um and are we looking at it from a security perspective as well but not only from a security perspective you you have all these different stage gates as you go through the systems development life cycle and does it actually pass the muster and that, and that's why i'm really kind of of, of saying that there isn't anything that AI is going to be able to produce right now where we are just going to accept it as is without any humans in the loop. Um, and, and that's the same thing for code. Is it, even though AI could generate that code, it still needs to go through a process of testing and validating security controls, all those things, um, a design review, architectural review, all of that. Um, so it's nothing that, so there, I agree with um, whoever said there is no line. Um, there, there really is no line because it definitely needs to have a lot of different review before we just accept um, someone just building a code with with um, AI. And I definitely think this is where transparency is involved as well. 
is that we're able to see what has been done with AI versus what has been done um, organically. And just to kind of kind of continue with that thread, the the idea of the communication, right? So like making sure the right stakeholders are are in the room in the conversation to figure out where is that line. And and the same thing kind of to the to the earlier question. A, a library is great where we can access it, but someone who is looking at that use case and going, hey, I think that would be great to use at my agency, but then you have no idea who to go to, right? Like who who in the OCIO shop, who in the policy shop, who, right? Like the idea of creating these essentially points of contacts and sharing that information and teams and making sure that the right stakeholders are involved so that there's an actual like implementation process and a, and a, and a path to follow versus someone going, hey, I think that'd be really useful with the limited time they have hitting enough walls and then they just throw their hands in the air and go, oh, well, yeah. right? Like creating that that communication again is, is key. All right, one more question. All right, Sandy. I, the other Sandy. <laughs> Hi. Um, so and actually started, Jason, when you started with some of your trivia earlier today about how many use cases all these all the departments have. I guess part of my question is more about how are you making decisions about which you, use cases are moving forward? Who's involved in those use case decisions? Because HHS is huge, you know, all of your DOT. So how do you go about that? What's the process look like? Well, I'll give my perspective, right? from my agency. And it goes back to what we all talked about, this idea of collaboration, right? And this idea that these use cases are a way to democratize problem solving in an organization. So for me, there's no such thing as a bad use case. There are use cases that have been fully staffed or not been staffed. But, you know, so it's not my judgment to say, you know, or any ex other executive, this is a good use case, this is a bad use case. It's a, is it staffed? What ROI are we expecting on it? Where does this fit into our roadmap on what we need to achieve in the agency at that point in time? So, you know, if the agency's priorities switch administration over administration, what that means is, guess what? The use cases that you thought you were going to execute are now deprioritized and some other use case gets prioritized. So, you know, there's no such thing as a good use case or bad use case. It's whether it's been staffed, whether it's not been staffed, what is that ROI there? And is it the right time to execute on that use case? And it's all, you know, different. So yeah, there's no such thing. I take every use case in there and we just slowly work it, you know, and part of that is also education where when we get a use case, we get those younger procurement specialists in and say, hey, how would you do an IGC on this? Because that's how they learn. You know, when we look at a financial or budget analyst, you know, we bring them in and say, how would you fund this knowing that it's a consumption-based model as opposed to a fixed price where you bought it once and you own you know, how do you build into that variability that if the vendor raises prices by 10%, then what, right? How do you build those in? Same thing with our program specialists. We bring them in and say, what are those core requirements that you need to make this use case successful? Is it trying to solve a problem, right? And is the problem big enough and scalable enough that we need to apply technology to it? You know, answering a letter that comes in once every eight months, do you really need to generate a fine-tuned large language model to do that? You know, maybe not. You know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if you get 12,000 letters a week on that same topic, do you need to have some sort of strategy to deal with that? So there's no such thing as a good use case or bad use case. It's just how mature that use case is in and how it's been staffed. Thank you. You got 30 seconds. Oh, okay. I'm in negative time. I don't know what happens if we get too far deep in next I'll be super time. fast. So I've noticed that when we align the um, 
what do you want the use case? What exactly how the organization reports to the bosses and gets funding? Like how if they uh, count the human hours saved, count the 12,000 emails, count the money that's going to be saved, that always makes a way. And also I've noticed that when the leaders are aware and involved in the project, it gets through. But if it changes, then the project might just die. And I've, I've noticed that a lot across many organizations. Great. Well, we could stay and talk about this all day, but uh, for now, that's it from this specific panel. Thank you, guys. All right. Well done, everyone. We have one last panel to go, and I got that one, too. So uh, hopefully my panelists are here. Um, and if they are, come to the stage, panelists. Steve's here. I know that. All right, here's everybody coming. All right, anyway, I know we have two people on the Zoom, so we'll give them a second to get Zoomed up. Um, Zoomed up. We are both here. All right, uh, folks, get settled, we get Zoomed up. Uh, I have more trivia, I know. No, you're excited. Uh, this is navigating the new way of AI and cyber and the workforce. I got to think, okay, so I, you know, this is the AI. Sound check. We got a small okay. issue here. We can't hear you clear enough. Okay. He's, are you, no. he's working on it. Give me a second. Now we're talking. Good. Hey, there you go. There you go. All right. So Jonathan and Sarah from DIU are joining us. Do we have, uh, and I think we have one more person potentially jo joining us too, um, from uh, um, from the DHS office, uh, Siso, Lamont. Say again. It's only two. Okay. Um, all right. We'll check with the folks at HR to make sure that I was told he was potentially going to join us virtually. But we will figure this out all together. Anyways, so it got me thinking about the the topic here: cyber, artificial intelligence. So I started looking at uh, our friends from OMB, who I spend lots of time with, and the memo. We've all read the OMB memo, right? We all loved it, learned it, live it, right? So um, one of the things that it came up with, it looks at the chief AI officer, and, and Ann Duncan was kind enough to tell us a little bit about the changes that happened in energy. And so it splits the roles and responsibilities for the AI office chief AI into three categories. So how many roles and responsibilities for that chief AI officer are outlined in that memo? How many? We're looking for a number. Yes, whoever said that. No one said anything, correct. Give me a guess. Come on, Greg. Help me out. Too little. That's good. Tim, give me a number because they won't, no one, no one, people are seven, too little. One more. 20, very close. 21 is the, the, the magic number. There's 10 roles and responsibilities under coordinating the use of AI, four under promoting innovation, and seven under managing the risks of AI. Okay, one last one. It's, you guys, are, there's a little warm up happening here. Last July, OPM identified uh, how many general competencies and how many technical competencies for federal employees need to work with AI. We're looking for, again, a number, two numbers, general and, and technical. So start with general. Give me a number 12, too little, 80, too high, somewhere in between. Close, 43, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Uh, technical competencies, how many? Much less. How about that? I'll, I'll give you a hint. Walter, you don't have a number? Just give me a number. Close. 14. Very good. <laughs> uh, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we're going to see uh, OPM is working with the National Science Foundation to complete out the I AI competency framework. Now, now, the goal of telling you all this is, is when we talk about cybersecurity, when we talk about uh, everything that goes into this, you got to have the people. That's what we've heard time and again today. And people matter. Training matters understanding what they can do with the AI, they can do it. So all that being said, uh, as I said in the last one, we are unplanned, unrehearsed, and uh, Colonel, you're right next to me. I'm gonna let you leave this off. Take three to five minutes and uh, tell us something we don't know about what you're doing around AI and cybersecurity. Uh, I feel like a little bit of this is a, a trick because earlier he's like, it's my microphone, don't touch the microphone. And now it's like, touch the microphone. You what? can talk for three minutes. You're on but... the stage. <laughs> 
Awesome. Cool. You've been uplifted. <laughs> it's almost like I'm on a platform. But anyway. Um, okay. So the first thing is the lawyers say I have to do the mandatory, not an official spokesperson for the government and all those things. So you've all heard the uh, government disclaimers. Just pretend that I said all of that and that all the other government employees probably said the same thing today so that their lawyers don't bother them. Uh, but with that, okay, so I'm with Forces Command. What's that? It's an Army organization. We have about 750,000 people. We supply combat forces wherever in the world they're needed. So we have to do all the training, the readiness, all the equipment maintenance. So it's not just dealing with people. It's all the tanks, the missile systems, the, the small rifles, all, all of that great stuff. So, um, you know, a, a lot of complexity. We have a wide age range. Uh, we've got people that just came out of high school. Actually, we have people still in high school. When you look at some of the National Guard folks that are able to join while still in high school, uh, we have all the way up to um, you know SESs. Uh, we have senior executives. We have so really, we got a lot of folks doing a lot of things with a lot of stuff, and we got a large uh, age range there. I enjoy talking with the uh, gentleman from the CDC earlier. Everybody he works with has at least a master's degree. He doesn't need to deal with those gender, the basic skill sets. Okay, so what are we actually doing and where, where do we actually uh, have some things? So like some other words, we are experimenting uh, with LLMs and what we could do for some uh, generative AI with that. So that's not that big of a deal or not that exciting because other folks are doing it as well. Um, a challenge that we're really trying to figure out and work through. How do I give these capabilities to my junior people so they can get the benefit of it, yet they get that development. So then when they're mid-tier or they're senior, they know how to do it without having the AI essentially acting as a crutch. Or if I have soldiers that are forward deployed and they lose that data link back, or they lose access to some of their electronics, how do they go ahead and have the skills necessary? They can break out a map and a compass, or they can figure out these other things. If we're doing, you know, with a rifle, they're going to learn to use the rifle with the iron sights before they get optics, before they get a scope on it. And I need to be able to have the equivalent to that as I, you know, you get them those basic foundational things. And, and I don't know yet, you know, what's that test? Can you write a document and you have an appropriately placed Oxford comma? And okay, now I will let the uh, generative AI help you with your next paper. So... The question I guess that comes to mind right off the bat is when you talk about the age range and, and, and the need to start applying the generative AI or, or take advantage of it, come fix fix I messed it up. Um, talk a little bit about like, does that require like, or, or, or do you feel like you're ahead of the, the game a little bit? You're behind it? Are you, because folks are, are the younger generation always gets the at least, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, perspective that oh well we're we know what we're doing right we we are we are digital natives which i always hate that term by the way because i grew up with the commodore 64 so i had the first computer uh, but anyways talk a little bit about what what, what the trend you're seeing yeah. or without that okay so the so first the, the the younger people out there um if you've ever dealt with the military if you know what an e4 is whether it's a lance corporal in the marines or a specialist in the army they are incredibly innovative the refrigerator doesn't work in the barracks. There's a new one there the next day. Somewhere across post is probably missing a refrigerator, but you know they found it. They had a challenge and they looked at what capabilities do I have? And I've got a vehicle, it's dark, and I've got three friends. And, and they get a new refrigerator. Um, but yeah, you know, so ChatGPT, it was out there. And we've actually had feedback from the Army CIOs. Please don't, don't have people writing their evals using ChatGPT because people are doing that. And so we see that with more mid-tier and more of the senior folks that have to write a lot of the evals. Um, and I will poke a little bit at the CDAO because they've got this initiative. We're gonna take all the generals and we're gonna put them through this three-day course about all the great things that AI can do for them. And you don't have most of those things we're gonna show them are not FedRAMPed, um, they don't have an ATO. Um, and, and now I've got generals that are very excited about doing something and they want to do stuff, which is good because they can lend that political will to help make it happen. Um, and so, there, so we got pressure from the, the seniors uh, wanting to do it. We got mid-level folks kind of uh, you know, skimming under the radar, like 
maybe they're actually using chat GPT on the evals, but fine. And then we have the, the lower level folks where uh, they're, they're, they're finding innovative approaches. And honestly, I don't know all of the things that they're doing and you know, probably nobody does. Um, I, I would not be surprised if some of them are running their own models. Uh, they're doing experimentation with it. And some of the best things about that experimentation is somebody's done you know, basic proof of concept on uh, you know, some cloud services they paid for out of pocket to say, can I, you know, I, I get RAG working with this model and then I do this other thing. But then they bring it into their boss and say, hey, you know what, we can do this. We just need to have the authority to do it at scale. And I love seeing that stuff get bubbled up to our office. And you know what, if you can get me more time back, get my first sergeants two more hours a week with their soldiers and three more hours a week with their family, I, I, I will do anything to help uh, get your solution into our, our office. Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna go to the uh, folks on the uh, Zoom and go to Johnson, uh, keep the DOD theme going. Uh, give us about, you know, little, little three to five minutes, tell us something we don't know about what you're doing around cyber at DIU. Cool, uh, I am the cyber commercial engagements uh, exec, so to speak, for the cyber and telecom portfolio here at Defense Innovation Unit. Um, our our mission in life is to accelerate the adoption of commercial tech and deliver them quickly and in scaled fashion to the hands of war, the warfighters. So um, it's less about researchy stuff and research grants, but more about helping them acquire um, innovative and uh, say um, very, very advanced uh, commercial tech and quickly prototype, test them, evaluate them, get them to at least a stage of interim authority to test or provisional ATO and field them as soon as possible. Um, so uh, you have yours truly uh, who covers cyber and my counterpart, Sarah, who covers AI ML. And together um, we, well, we have six portfolios and uh, you only, two guys from two different uh, portfolios here. From the cyber front, um, we have started a long time ago as consumers of AI ourselves. Way back when the pandemic first started, we we're talking about working from home. Uh, we quickly, that was even before COVID hit, we embarked on a project that um, uses uh, AI enabled uh, endpoint agents and CASBs, uh, cloud access security brokers, SASE, Secure Access, Secure Edge. And we used it ourselves, completed the prototype, and that laid the foundation for DISA's uh, Thunderdome, what they call Thunderdome. Um, we have a host of uh, um, zero trust and AI ML uh, enabled products uh, in there right now. Um, we also helped the Air Force do an autonomous SOC project with the precursors of a lot of AI enabled you, um, user uh, endpoint uh, behavior analytics um, that automates the seam and the soar. Uh, these days, of course, everybody says AI. Back in the day, a few years ago, people are not gutsy enough to say it. They're still saying, oh, it's an, uh, a, a way to streamline your um, uh, uh, incidents response playbook. Uh, using Bayesian technology to try to figure out um, the whole uh, attack sequence and recommend. Now, at the time, the products are just recommending. They're not executing fixes and all that. So uh, fast forward a few years, uh, we have, um, we're now under recent new management. Um, the, uh, the focus has shifted a little bit and uh, in terms of the cyber portfolios, um, focus and discipline, we're looking more at AI enabled, AI augmented hunt forward capabilities. And, um, and that also segues to uh, Sarah's discipline, uh, deep fake detection. And uh, maybe I should stop here and hand it over to uh, Sarah. Naturally at DIU, so many of the technologies straddle our different portfolios, hence the, the pause on deep fake. Yeah. Um, before I go to deep fake, I actually wanted to go back just one step. So as Johnson just said, we're kind of this unique organization in that we sit within the Department of Defense, specifically within the office of the Secretary of Defense reporting to the Secretary. 
is kind of thing one. However, folks like Johnson and I and many others, we spend a lot of time looking outwards outside of the Defense Department, outside of the intelligence community, focused on understanding what are the best products that are available to solve all the challenges that we're, we're facing within the DOD and IC. It, given kind of that epicenter that DIU sits within, and DIU is not alone, by the way. I know just in listening to the last panel and some of the folks we have on this panel, many agencies are standing up their own innovation group. So we're not a unique, we are just the version for the DOD. So I know this is a problem that is highly scalable, but by sitting at this epicenter, we are faced with tons of information, whether that is every conversation with an end user, as we say, other folks inside the DOD that have a challenge that they think cyber technologies, AI technologies, autonomous space, picket, right? That those technologies could solve their problems. So that's one data stream, people with problems, needs that are funded inside the defense department. Another data stream is all these companies, thousands. I don't know, Johnson, how many companies do we meet a year? That five, four or 5,000? A lot. So just cyber itself, there are more than 4,000 analyst covered companies that are knocking on the doors of DOD every day. And I have another story to tell. I'm gonna hold that and <laughs> let you finish first, Sarah. <laughs> so we're meeting with companies. We're meeting with all of the funders, the people that pour money into many of these, what we used to always say is Silicon Valley venture back companies. But of course, innovation occurs across the DOD, across the globe, and we're not limited to just Silicon Valley, which is where, where we sit. Um, so that's another data stream, all these companies and the people pouring money into the companies, the academic space, the list goes on. There's a lot of data. So to your question of, hey, where are you focused right now? There is a list and we'll get into it more in this, this uh, panel. But what I wanted to hit first is a lot of folks inside DIU have turned to people like Johnson, myself, people that look external at companies to say, how can we make better sense all these data streams in a near real time fashion. So, and you know, enter a lot of the Gen AI capabilities that could help us streamline things like evaluating companies, could help us streamline, streamline things like the procurement mechanisms that are a little unique to our, our organization. How could we do that? So um, that's thing one, just how do we help our employee base, which is only 200-ish, I think we're a little shy of 200. Um, how do we help them be more efficient and move faster? Because we're just in an org that has to move exceptionally fast so that the secretary and the de deputy expect us to. Um, so that's thing one, Gen AI use cases inside DIU. Happy to dive into you know, any questions that may come as a result of that. The second piece when it hit that Johnson's really been leading is this deep fake space. So for, I don't know, as long as I've been here, so call it four years, we have been flirting with a lot of different technologies around the mis and disinformation space. Uh, deep fakes just being one of those very important veins. So if you timestamp that back four years, the sophistication of mis and disinformation, of deep fakes and other altered synthetic uh, media has really evolved, right? This is one of those areas where AI just took a problem. It was already really challenging to wrap your arms around and it just went up and to the right at an exponential rate over the last two years. So um, Finally, we are move, moving forward with a project, meaning that we've got an awesome end user group that has a need that needs to get solved as soon as possible, has funding to put behind it, and also has the risk appetite to try one of these you know, more bleeding edge technologies, capabilities that work, but within a DOD or IC setting. So um, this solicitation will be coming out in Johnson next two to three weeks in, in a short I don't want to jinx it. Two weeks, maybe? Okay, so there we go. Um, relatively soon, um, we'll be posting the solicitation on our website, which is what we do for every single program that we work, um, diu.mil, and it'll talk about, it, literally, it's just a one pager. Here's the problem. It is to identify altered synthetic media sources, right, imagery, video, et cetera, and be able to do that at scale. So um, let me pause there. Johnson, you've been working this program a ton. Anything you would add on the deep fake front, though? Uh, that's the extent we can disclose for now. <laughs> Here's a sneak peek of what we're working on here. Yeah, right. So, Johnson, you were going to tell us a quick story or, or have a quick follow-up. What do you prefer? I'll tell the quick story. So, uh, right. as a side job of, uh, of 
various DIU portfolios, we actually, we also work very closely with DOD CIO, uh, especially uh, with the uh, industry engagement front office, so to speak. They're always bombarded with uh, vendors that claim AI supremacy, zero trust supremacy, uh, blockchain, quantum, whatever. So uh, we do a lot of uh, market mapping uh, for DOD CIO as the policy makers. And we're closely tracking um, their prescriptions, so to speak, uh, in, in terms of AI in their zero trust cybersecurity stack. Uh, I would highly encourage the audience, if interested, um, to look at uh, DOD CIO's uh, uh, COA 1 document. You will see that AI um, in cybersecurity includes automation and orchestration um, and, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, capabilities and, and activities. But at this point in time, their prescription for the specific activities are, are listed in what's called the advanced zero trust category. It is still not in the basic, um, uh, I'd say minimum zero trust category. And it is our job to help um, accelerate the trials, at least uh, give it a spin, don't have the stigma of, oh, it's AI, what it's gonna do? Is it gonna leak my data? Uh, is it, uh, um, how can I test products from a vendor uh, that doesn't have like IL-5 hosting or FedRAMP high certification, things like that? There are creative ways of doing that and um, I'm sure uh, Sarah has had projects that uh, have seen challenges of not having real data uh, for the models to work on and the security of the models and all that. So we as DIU, as the, I'd say Sherpa of these prototype projects, uh, we take on the task of helping, um, I'd say, push uh, stuff you know, over the boundaries into uh, I would say material execution that leads to um, good and disciplined evaluation of products that are to be fielded. So Sarah mentioned the RFP. I appreciate that, Sarah. Well, I'll be on the lookout now because it sounds super interesting. Uh, Johnson, when you're talking about the DOD CIO and moving AI into cyber advanced part of zero trust, is there some work you're doing currently in that area? Ah, uh, uh... This is something, so stay, stay tuned for uh, a most likely a, a probable announcement. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet. You're just among friends, come on. <laughs> I'll get right. myself well, to keep trouble. Well, appreciate it. But stay all tuned. Right. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, we'll come back to you all. We're gonna jump back to the live panel. Uh, Peter from CISA, you just heard all this exciting stuff happening uh, at DIU. Uh, what are, you, what are you guys doing at CISA? Come on. Well, it's funny. There's, there's a lot of overlap between my my professional life and my private life as a cybersecurity person. You know, I'm an eternal pessimist. So I have little kids at home. So I'm always yelling, you know, slow down, stop. You're going to hurt yourself. I hear all this exciting work as a cybersecurity person. You know, I think the same thing. But, we, you know, these technologies are coming. They're going to be immensely capable. And, and obviously, they are the future. The, the things that I would highlight from a CISA perspective, I would kind of draw, draw two connections back to things we're doing at CISA. One you know, adopting these kind of technologies, it really highlights the need to be executing well on the fundamental cybersecurity practices. So, you know, full disclosure of bias, my team manages the CISA cyber performance goals. That's my favorite child. So I would, I would point to those practices. You all are probably more advanced than a lot of the kind of smaller critical infrastructure we talk to. So you're more familiar with using the full NIST CSF. So first I would highlight the importance of really mastering those before you know implementing the, the, these um, AI solutions. And then the other piece that I'll, I'll probably focus on more today because it's probably more pertinent to this crowd is the notion of secure by design. So AI is software, AI works with other software and, and kind of one of the most important initiatives at CISA right now is promoting this secure by design concept of, of, of building and selling software that is secure from the outset. And I know we say, oh, it all is anyway. We know that's not true. And so that's something that we want to promote, not just to the vendor side of, hey, use secure design practices, but also on the consumer side of, hey, you know, contracting officers and folks, when you go out there with requirements, 
that secure development process should be one of your requirements. Hey, vendor, you know, did you build using the secure software development framework, things like that. And so, again, those are the two things that I wanted to, to sell you on today, but uh, just appreciate being here. All right, I got another one for you then. You made it easy. Secure by design, something we've heard a lot of uh, folks talk about OMB, CISA, and really press it. Uh, you guys have released some good FAQs, for lack of a better word, approaches. What comes next? What should folks look out for, both from an agency side and an industry side? Okay, what is, okay, CIS is promoting this, they're pushing this. Uh, we know that there's a software asset station form is out there. What comes next in, in the secure by design world that you like to say, hey, look out for this or keep keep in mind, or here's here's how we're going to interact with industry and or agencies next? Yeah, so so good question. And and specifically for, for the work my team's focusing on is, you know, the attestation form is out there. Um, kind of in parallel to that, you know, our team published the cross-sector cybersecurity goals. Now we're working on sector-specific goals. And for the IT sector, those aren't going to be enterprise actions. Those are going to be product security focused. So I'm not going to give you a specific date, but in the very near future, that, that should be coming out. And again, that'll be a, be a set of, of, let's call it 12 to 15 practices, again, for those developers to say, hey, are you doing this list of things in your development? And then there's also another piece of pendant to it of, hey, here's two or three uh, features that we think should be baseline features within to, to consider software secure by design and secure by default. All right. You know I want to ask you the date, but you told me you don't want to tell, tell me. So It's close. close. It's close. The ubiquitous sooning government. It could be any day now. All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, Steve from Genesis. Now, you just heard a lot of this excitement around cybersecurity. You're not, you guys aren't even a cyber company. Yes, we are. <laughs> so, so, so are we a cyber practitioner by to deliver a cyber service product? No. Are we a FedRAMP cloud authorized service provider? Yes, wow. we are. Aren't we are? Uh, well, right. no, we're not. <laughs> um, and uh, more importantly, you know, uh, as much as AI is proliferating today in the media about, you know, chat, generative AI, chat GPT, all that good stuff, AI has been part of our portfolio since almost since our inception. So if you look at the analytics portion or uh, something as simple as uh, self-service, or you talk about predictive chat, predictive engagement, or something, go back to text-to-speech and speech-to-text, right, transcription. Those services have always been part and parcel to our product set. But um, we've been faced with the, the new challenge of not only are we doing this inside a, a FedRAMP authorized or whatever, pick an arithmetic framework compliance that you choose for the day, um, we've been doing this for so long that we have a commercial baseline set that we have to move into uh, the compliance space. So then it's, it becomes a, well, what do we have to have first? And what do we have next? Um, and then, of course, we want to be leaders in the space. We believe we are. Um, and that pulls in chat GPT and generative AI right to the front. Just been recognized as a leader in the, in the, by IDC for that. But it was not a, an overnight thing. Right? So I learned a cool fact. Uh, we have more than 470 people dedicated in the company to nothing but the development and implementation of AI in the portfolio. So uh, we're pretty proud of that, but it still has to come with all those garbage you talked about, right? So uh, we, the company is now adopting a, uh, we've got to look at the, at the, at the federal side at the, at the same time, not back it in, because you can't back it in, right? And so that, that cyber first mentality is starting to come around. All right, so we're going to get to your questions, but Steve, I have a follow-up for you. Um, when you talk to customers and when you when you public sector customers or private sector customers, what's the question you're getting a lot around cyber AI about, you know, what do people want to know? It, it's where do I start? It's almost always where do I start, right? Because there's, there's a combination of the deer and headlights and then the kamikaze, I'm going all in right away, right? And um, I was doing a panel, I always quote a, a guy from OPM, and I don't want to use his name because I had to ask permission, but he, he used a term called catastrophic success, which I really love, um, and that's what you want to avoid. And that is the take a, maybe you take this nice slow approach that we recommend, which is you identify a use case, you create your criteria, baseline it, you have measurable criteria at the end, and then you, you do your pilot. Let's say it's successful, word gets out. Suddenly it's, it's a panacea for everything and it's out of control. Now you, you know, you've got boundary challenges, you've got funding challenges, and then you know, general expectations, right? So we, we, we try to help guide that process with a crawl, walk, run approach. And there are so many different ways to do that. But um, the biggest question is how do I start aware? We always go down the analytics path, which is if you want to know where you're going, you got to find out where you are. In our industry, for those of you that don't know, Genesis is a contact center as a service company. We uh, are uh, Gartner recognized top right quadrant for uh, and we're cloud service providers. So CCAS as a service, obviously cloud, but we have a heritage contact center for over 35 years, right? So we're at this for a while. 
that being said, uh, try to drive this this through the, the, the federal agencies at the pace they want is is where we keep getting the conflict. Like, I want it now. I don't know how to do it. You give them a slow framework. Uh, if they adopt the principles of of of, of a pilot phase, like all work running, we see that they'd be the most successful. All right. Uh, any? Oh, there we go. A couple. Of, nice. All right, Omar, I'm going to go because it's on. She's on my left side first. All right. Hi, uh, it could be any for any one of you. So with, with the new era of remote work, people working remotely from anywhere and everywhere with multiple locations and all the GAN, uh, you know, adversarial network happening and generating new types of hacking met methodologies and network issues having, what are the major challenges you're seeing right now and how are you addressing them? Specifically remote work. Okay, so um, one that, that was hit on uh, on a previous panel was, where's our data? Because we have restrictions on what data can leave the US. And within our organization, well, great, we have people that are training and they're doing stuff, then they go to Europe or the Pacific or, or wherever else. And for some environments or some cases, they're able to take their, their data with them. Um, and but that leads to a whole lot of bureaucracy on the back end, a lot of planning that we have to do. And then we also end up with you know, multiple four star commanders, which have no ego and they're very <laughs> uh, friendly and, and cooperative with each other. Um, and, they're, and they're happy to have another four star putting their people with a different policy in their area. Um, so that, that makes uh, for exciting and, and relaxing afternoons. Uh, Johnson or uh, Sarah, uh, the, the question was around remote work and or yeah. it was around kind of how to deal with telework. You all, you both maybe are working from home today? We are mostly a telework organization and um, there there are many measures to, to help with um, like advanced user entity uh, behavior analytics. Um, adaptive comply to connect, uh, profiling the location of the user and, and the, the login hours and the pattern. Uh, a lot of these are AI augmented um, commercial products that we integrate into our own cybersecurity stack, as well as, I mean, with the, with the help of DISA, if you're, if you're uh, not with DIU, but with uh, other parts of the DOD, you're enabled to, uh, to do that. But um, with the more advanced threats, the time to reaction, um, especially when you're overseas, um, that's you, you just have to have a much shorter time to reaction, especially with AI generated threats. We're tracking companies that are engaging in a violent cat and mouse game with AI enabled defense against AI uh, generated threats. That's number one. Um, number two is in terms of data security, there are a lot of obfuscation plays there that you can use to obfuscate the queries and you can obfuscate uh, the location of, of the rendezvous, so to speak, so that when you access a certain piece of data, at least your network connections are not uh, trackable. Um, you have now uh, eliminated that network order from the whole equation. Um, and the third thing, maybe uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open a whole can of worms for 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 Sarah, is uh, uh, MLSEC. There's also uh, securing your AI models. We're also tracking uh, a, a bunch of companies that are very well received in the commercial space. Maybe Sarah, if if you want to, uh, you can talk about MLSEC. Yeah, happy to. Uh, DIU's been in the ML game for eight years. I don't know, since its inception, right? The majority of our projects kind of sat in that space. So making sure that we had robustness, and this gets a little bit outside of your question of remote work folks, because DIU employees aren't generally fingers on keyboard, hands on keyboard type of thing for our projects, right? They're our end customers. But MLSEC, MLOps, kind of key areas of how we go from development with ML models to scaling and production of these models. Um, I don't know that we've put any on contracts from an MLSEC mm -hmm. perspective. But we're tracking a whole bunch. But we're definitely aware of them. Um, 
Maybe the other thing I want to go back to the original question real quick on like how did we do the remote thing? Johnson obviously knows that the tech piece way better from a cyber perspective, but I also think some of this is cultural, and I know everyone's dealt with this for four plus years at this point, but a lot of our organization does work in cleared spaces. So our ability to kind of network across the DOD and the IC to make sure we still had access or adopting some of these stiff in a box type solutions um, are all things that we were just forced to lean in on early because we couldn't stop the work just because COVID you know, kind of set in and we had those limitations. So um, I would also say we were just early adopters on some of those solutions. Again, probably because of our risk threshold or just the cultural norms we have inside DIU. Steve or, or uh, Peter? Steve? Well, I mean, in the beginning, uh, when, when remote was COVID driven, obviously it was a crash course for contact centers, right? I mean, it went from infrastructure to like, if we don't have enough VPN connectivity for every year, we allow our top connections. Over the top has got to be a nightmare for DOD to start taking out any type of security in, you know, so we've got an encrypted rest, encrypted motion. But um, the focus went from getting the infrastructure going to making sure they're functional to, okay, that cultural thing, workforce employee management, right? Engagement management, how, how are you making the employee experience not only so that they can function as if they were in an office, because that's really been our, you know, that's been really part and parcel of technology from the beginning, but how do you help augment the experience for them? So, you know, whether it's something as simple as shift bidding or whether it's, uh, uh, making sure that you are tracking with, with the right an analytics, you know, productivity and access, those tools being there at the disposal uh, today that are AI augmented to help just make a, it's a better strategy. Um, and you're allowed to maybe staff better. Um, and also you have to start looking at when you have remote workers now, you can maybe do partial shifts. And in the contact center space, when you start doing that kind of reporting and analytics to improve customer experience, and you forget about the employee experience, it's a problem. So that's where we've seen most focus. And yeah, the only thing I'd add is, you know, we work a lot with what our director calls the target rich cyber poor. And so there, it, it's a matter of highlighting the fundamentals. You know, when you when you talk to somebody that, I won't name a, a sector, but in certain sectors, where they're not even sure what MFA is, where to us, like that's non-negotiable for remote access. We even say OT should have MFA for remote access, which people tell us isn't even possible half the time. But, you know, that's that's one of the challenges, you know, speaking a little bit outside of the government space, there's a lot of education necessary in a lot of the, you know, K through 12 water, state, local, tribal, territorial of, hey, these are the minimums you have to have in place to do these practices safely. All right, we got another question, Omar. Uh, don't touch my mind. I won't. I won't. <laughs> Uh, for me, I, I was very happy to see the support that CIDA was given to our agencies, especially in the cybersecurity space, where, where I am not able to tap into that resource is in the Defense Innovation Unit and Research Lab. And maybe this is Colonel Hartman, if you can help us socialize the idea of collaboration between the DOD innovation, the AI, and the civilian side. Because for me, I've attend, and attended a couple of uh, conferences where I've seen the capabilities of those folks like Johnson and Sarah, but there is no connect between us. Like I cannot go and just ask them for lesson learned or an area that they have assessed that I am planning to spend taxpayers' money on so they can give guidance and, and share their, their experience. I don't know how we can get it done and this is really vital for our competitive advantage for our government and, and, and our citizens. So this is, I mean, something that, you know, you guys can connect with me and socialize. I can bring my, you know, our innovation hand and, and our CISO and, uh, and the leaders of our organization and other folks that we, we, we have connection with to see DOD is doing great work here we can leverage, we can repurpose for our civilian duties. So the, the question is why not? There's no reason, but Colonel Hartman, jump in. So I'm not going to commit DIU to anything because uh, that's probably different generals once again. Uh, however, with, with force comp, so the second Tuesday of the month, we have set aside to meet with vendors. The second Thursday of the month, we have set it aside to meet with AI focused vendors. Uh, because some companies really are doing stuff with AI and machine learning. And there's a few others that are aspirational. And um, somebody in the marketing department put AI on their banner with a little Photoshop. And that's 
well, it's aspirational. Um, so I, I, I okay, I, I regret saying this in public with multiple vendors, but please you know, reach out. We'll, we'll get you on the schedule. Uh, I've talked with uh, some of you around the room today. Uh, so he's and, government. So is there, is there room, where's the government fit in? Oh, as the government, oh, heck yeah. And even better, if you're with the government, let me know. We will let you know which vendors we've got scheduled for which Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you're welcome to bomb in on those such sessions. So they don't have to come bother you and your EA, and then you can kind of like hide off to the side a little bit. Yeah, so we, we've got uh, DARPA that sets in on some, uh, CENTCOM, some other organizations. Hey, great. If, if the if the best thing I could do is sometimes be the front person that, that takes a little bit of the beating and the phone calls, and it helps set multiple agencies, happy to do that. So maybe the one thing and I'm, from a DIU, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I missed the agency that the gentleman who asked the question was coming from. Could I hear that one more time? H HUD, HUD slash Ginny May. Perfect. So um, I'm sorry that you've been unsuccessful in kind of getting a response from the DIU team. I would say that we are constantly hopping on calls and sharing best practices from kind of how we built this innovation engine to how we've run over I think 260 projects at this point, to your point on, hey, you've got challenges, you've got taxpayer money, um, what's already been done? Can I buy something that, you know, the Air Force and the Army and the Navy already prototyped, it's now in production, I just want a license to do the exact same thing on, you know, my infrastructure or my data. So those are all key conversations that we have. We have a whole team that sits a little adjacent to Johnson and I, though admittedly we wear many hats and we, him and I end up in these conversations too, but, um, I would say if we can exchange information, I don't know if people plan to share contact information or you can go to our website. We do monitor the contact us form on our website at diu.mil. And if you select either cyber or AI, um, you'll see there's a workflow. It'll land in Johnson's or my inbox and we, we're happy to follow up and we'll bring the right people from our side. And, and just to follow up on what Colonel Hartman said, and if you're in industry, because there's industry people in the room, I'm sure you have industry days and other uh, information sessions too. So we, yes and no, we don't, we're not as prescriptive of like, you know, Tuesdays we hear AI or whatever that awesome schedule was. Um, instead, what we do is we, yes, we'll constantly meet with industry and the way to contact us is through that same contact us form that you find on our website uh, is one, two, as we're curating programs, the way we alluded to some of the programs we're curating right now that will soon go to solicitation in our, our competition, we also do a ton of outreach. So that's that's all on our commercial teams to make sure we know all the best kind of products and companies in a space. So a lot of it is us reaching to industry uh, to set up time to learn more around their products. But yes, uh, yes to both. Land on our website, submit the form, and it's a monitored inbox. All right. We have another question from the audience. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so bringing us back to the topic, uh, remote work area, a lot of agencies are getting more serious about mobile and bring your own device. How equipped or uh, ready do you think your agencies are to manage that? Okay. I would say it's just so we're pretty good. <laughs> like, I mean, but again, like I, I'm from CISA, but then like we consider the 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 critical infrastructure community like our our partners, and so there it's a bigger challenge. And again, it's a sliding scale. If, if I talk to a large financial institution in New York, they're good, they're great. Like the way they frame themselves, I'm an IT company with a bank attached. If I talk to a school district in Nebraska, it's more challenging. It's it's. It's not necessarily a matter of technical know-how. It, it's a matter of, of resourcing and what gets prioritized when. I'll say Army in the unclassified space. Yeah, we're pushing a lot. Uh, bring your own device. Where will we? Okay, Netcom. So different part of Army. But anyway, they. Um, you know, but they're managing the infrastructure behind it. People can access everything they need to access. Uh, I'm traveling with a personal laptop, not a government laptop. And... Uh, use Azure Virtual Desktop to get access into the full enterprise environment. So we're going to be seeing more of that. Um, you know, we we do have uh, ongoing concerns about what that container is writing on. So if somebody's got too much evil on their device, um, does that you know present a threat? Uh, does 
you know, like Quaka presented earlier, are people volunteering information on their personal devices um, that maybe, you know, they weren't getting tracked by what was on the container, but they are getting tracked by what's on, on the other stuff on their device. Um, so we, we do still have some concerns, but we got some pretty good infrastructure. We have hundreds of thousands of people using it every day. And uh, the Netcom commander, I, I believe, is largely traveling without government issued electronics, except for some of his um, classified access things. Another question? I have a question for yeah. Federal. Go ahead. Federal, as the industry guy, when you are looking to evaluate the industry, for what is, is everything use case driven? I and mean, what how do you find us? Right. I mean, we can obviously knock on your door and everybody's knocking on your door. What and take not necessarily Genesis, but in general, the industry, what are your search? You know, how are you going out there? Are you, are you looking at specific reports? Are you looking at any kind of ratings? You talk to Bob, Bob says X. What are you doing to find out what's out there if they're not coming to you first? Not that they're not pestering the heck out of you because we do that, but how do you how do you how do you find us? What's what you know, how do you look for us? It can't be a Google search. Well, maybe it is, but I'm guessing not. Johnson, you want to take that to start? Yeah, I'll take that to start. I, I have a I have a very easy job. Um, it's my it's my Rolodex of commercial CISOs. Um, there is Gartner. There is Momentum Cyber, there's Forrester, there is, of course, Black Hat, RSA. Uh, if it's more Gov focused, the FCA conferences. Um, and also people that have are doing and or have done labs before. Um, so at DIU, we have a certain evaluation criteria when we uh, do like source selection, relevance, technical merit. Um, company and product viability and innovativeness. When it comes to company viability and product viability, um, it's oftentimes product reviews, references, um, evidence of a scaled and successful deployment and being able to articulate your interoperability. There are a heck of a lot of products that, you know, if you, if you just read the white paper or the, the glossies, they look real good. But when it comes to um, interoperating with an existing security stack or an infrastructure, they just fall flat on their faces. And that's why maybe I'm, I'm speaking at the risk of disclosing too much. Uh, we're trying to embark on an effort to um, rally industry to form a sustainable and self-sustained proving grounds for you to, for industry to prove themselves before knocking on our doors to pitch to us saying that, hey, I've got a bunch of PhDs and I've got 10 patents and this is the best thing ever for uh, you know, edge computing, cyber, blockchain, yada, yada, yada. Maybe I'd add one slash two things to that. The first would be, and I actually view this as a bit of a differentiator for DIU, we hire folks with the experience of building these products and companies. So Johnson's humble, he's, built cyber companies, sold cyber companies, invested in cyber companies. Like everybody knows Johnson in cyber. I don't have that background. I come from building AI products at big companies like Google. So when you, when you understand how these technologies are built, how they're brought to market, how they're scaled inside of a market, it does give you a little bit of an advantage, I think, in terms of evaluating it, sitting on the flip side. So piece is the people that we hire. Um, the second thing, Folks will typically ask us, hey, am I too early for DIU? Am I too late? Our answer is typically, do you have a product is thing one. So you're not proposing to build something. You have a product. Um, and then part two to that question is how many enterprises or users are on that platform today? And this is to the point Johnson just made on customer references. We're generally not going to enter into a prototype contract with something that's unproven, which lends which lends our process to be more towards mature companies, right? Not your typical three people in a garage pre-product scenario that people think of. So um, yeah, a little bit more that I wanted to add in terms of how we, how we evaluate. Sorry, one other thought there. The tooling piece is not insignificant. The, the manual piece is of, yes, who we know because the industries we come from and the products, but just in AI, obviously hundreds of AI companies have popped up in the last 18 to 24 months, thousands actually. Um, or people have rebranded to be AI companies. So a lot of our job is now deciphering 
uh, AI to what, right? Or how legitimate or how mature are these different offerings? So um, we leverage some different tooling to help pressure test products and data and things like that as well. Do you want to go or do you want me to, I have one more question otherwise. So, so the, the last piece, I guess, maybe to round out some of that, where, where do we find cool companies? It's kind of been touched on with word of mouth. I love going to different conferences and walking around the back wall, uh, which, hey, everybody's around the back wall, but you, know, you walk around the back wall. That's where the innovative things are. That's where the new things are. Yeah, some of them are get acquired by Microsoft or wherever else, but seeing this is what's being developed. This is where the cool stuff is and, and identifying it early on. It may not be a thing that we can use today, but knowing it's out there, keep an eye on it, maybe 18 months. All right, we're just about out of time, but anyone have one last burning question? Otherwise, all right. So I have one last burning question. So uh, Colonel, I'm gonna start with you. We heard from Johnson and Sarah, uh, Sarah regarding some of the RFPs and stuff they're working on. Futures Command, you have entitled Futures. <laughs> so, but I'm with Forces Command. Forces, so, sorry. Yeah. But I had, I had Future in my brain, but it's fine. Oh. You have forces. We, will, we will help get you to the future. You will help us get to what, what is on your agenda? What is on your party list? Uh, give a sense of, of, of what's the next initiative or set of initiatives you're going to work on or are working on. Okay, okay. so I, I'm going to answer with our near-term thing that's going to happen. Uh, we've been working closely with Microsoft, and we think we can fix all of that fight that's been happening with PowerPoint for the last two decades, uh, where people spend <laughs> hours trying to get the fonts and the... Uh, that's not true. No, it, it's, 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 it's true. Uh, and it goes back to the document master and when copilot comes online in the a365 10 in june or july but uh, so after we've you harvested those tens of thousands of hours uh, on a daily basis back uh, then we're going to be able to repurpose those for for other things and driving more innovation uh, we are working closely we got our first chief data officer um, being able to actually start you know doing better things with data uh, I would say, you know, like if you're at a company or battalion level, you're okay if you can only see a month into the future. Um, we're, we have to be able to see four years into the future. So uh, are there enough, um, is there enough iron being harvested or, or you know, mined so that they're going to be able to make the enough engines for the next series of tanks that's getting fielded um, two and a half years from now? Um, I, I, I don't know, but we know which data sets, we know who's got those data sets, and we can start getting that perspective built. Peter, different question, because I already asked you that question. But if you want to answer it, you can. But I was going to ask you, uh, you have a group of industry, you have a group of uh, government here. What What is beyond Secure by Design, which we talked about, what, what do you want people to know about kind of where the critical infrastructure systems work is to, to kind of get that area more prepared for the cyber future? I think the, the biggest thing is raising that minimum bar. Like there, there's a lot of entities out there, critical infrastructure that do a great job there's a lot that we have to move up. Uh, like I'm not, not naming specific sectors and, and it's, it's a lot of times it's a resource consideration, but a big part of our focus is, is establishing that minimum baseline of saying, we need to get everybody, everybody at or above this mark. And then by extension, they're better positioned to safely use something like AI. So that, that's, I think the reason we're doing those things secure by design is trying to take some of that burden off of the user and shift it to maybe the more technically capable vendor to again, raise all those ships up and establish a, a better baseline in this country. All right. uh, Sarah Johnson, I'll give you both the last word as well. Then Steve gets the absolutely last word. So Steve, start thinking. Uh, Sarah, I'll start with you since Johnson went first last time. Um, you, you mentioned about finding the right organizations to work with. You mentioned about some some upcoming RFPs that you have coming or, or examples. Oh, What's the message you want to make sure folks you leave folks with about what you're doing around AI, ML, and the like at DIU? In the last 12 months, when DIU was elevated to report to the Secretary of Defense, that changed the focus of our projects. Um, what that did is that put us, enabled us to sit at the same table as folks like combatant commanders and others um, that report to the Secretary. And that gives us undiluted information to what the most pressing needs are to influence operational planning. Uh, because of that access now and a little bit of our expertise around different technologies, I think you're going to see a shift in the types of programs that we run here at DIU. All of our programs, again, are posted on our website, but um, I would say over the next uh, four months, however much time we have to spend 
a good amount of money now that everybody is funded inside the DOD. I would keep a close eye on our website. There will be some really interesting products, or excuse me, programs ranging from deep fake, we talked about enterprise service bus capabilities, modeling and simulation, and so much more. Johnson. And you got a huge budget bump. You got a huge budget yeah, bump. That we did. Yep. Got a pretty significant increase uh, with the appropriations bill. Correct. Okay. Johnson, any last words? Uh, I'm just going to do the textbook approach and uh, recite the vision for DIU 3.0. <laughs> Ensure that the department can leverage the best of commercial technology and innovation at speed and scale to deter major conflict or win it if forced to fight. That said, there are some implications uh, uh, for the cyber portfolio. We are likely going to be veering away from enterprise uh, IT infrastructure mo modernization to a little bit of more of the esoteric, I would say, um, obfuscation. Uh, active defense, investigative cyber, hunt forward, or cyber ops, so to speak. Um, you will also see a lot of uh, comms-related projects uh, out of DIU, um, mesh communications for drones, and also um, uh, jam, re jam resistance and resilient comms uh, and pace plans for, for communications uh, in general. All right, Steve, guess what? You get the last word. All right. Take so, it from your phone. Yeah. That's, why, that's why I hold it. So I guess I'll have to, you know, where industry's going, what you're going to see from us in response to where you guys are going to go as quickly as we can is uh, it's going to be that integration with the analytics and uh, a portion with the real time processing of, of, in our space, perhaps, right? You know, processing multimedia, any channel calls, right? So I want to, Natural language and speech are all great, but if I want to do sentiment analysis on the fly to detect a threat on a call, actively take that call and move it to where it needs to go and get the attention dynamically to make sure it's getting acted on, you know, rather than using it simply as a quality assessment tool after the fact for sentiment analysis to the agent respond properly, you're going to see that kind of stuff happening much more quickly and you're going to see the lines getting blurrier. It's getting harder and harder to tell whether you have a chat bot or an agent, right? You're probably always going to be able to tell eventually, but the natural language is getting better. The language models are getting better. And you're going to see us uh, as an industry just bring bring everything really tighter and, and be more responsive. All right. Let's give the panelists online on, in the person a round of applause. Nice job, everyone. All right. So two more two more seconds to let you all go. First of all, thank you all for attending today. There is tomorrow, half day tomorrow. So do not forget about that. If you're staying overnight, if you're in town, please come back. Enjoy the, the speakers tomorrow. Uh, and uh, at 5.30, I think back on the lawn, there's a, a reception. So uh, you have about an hour and a half to do whatever you need to do, and then hopefully come back at 5.30. So thank you all for the great day. Thank you, panelists.